to work in true depth, whether for personal development or clinical practice, requires an understanding of complexes. As the day-to-day -day agents of suffering, they represent what we all must deal with to adapt properly and become who we are. Complexes are not just psychodynamic structures. They are full biopsychosocial states. Autonomously split from our timeline, they always try to trap us in the past, whilst our genome and its instincts are aiming towards the future. To resolve them is the starting point of individuation. This video, designed for the serious autodidact of depth psychology, is the most comprehensive guide to date on the psychosystems analysis model of complexes, developed by Steve and Pauline Richards, depth psychologists with 43 years of frontline clinical experience each. They are also my mentors. Everything spoken by me in this video comes directly from my training under them. Let's take a journey through the psyche together, from the so-called personal unconscious all the way down to the ancestral psyche, as we explore everything we possibly can about complexes in a single YouTube video. For, to use a metaphor from Steve, the Large Hadron Collider uncovers the hidden layers of reality through colliding subatomic particles and seeing what emerges from within. The same is true for those who suffer psychologically. The breakdown can reveal that which is normally hidden as symbolic representations of the deeper structure of the universe. The psyche is not only archaeological, it is not only evolutionary, it is ontological too. The first part of this video is well over an hour of original graphics and animations, walking us through what complexes are, how they form through dissociation, how to work on them via dreams, and the development of our understanding of them, from Pierre Janet through Carl Jung, to Ernest Rossi, and Steve and Pauline Richards. We'll be covering both Janaean complexes, the agents of neurosis and psychological suffering, and deep structure complexes, the metaphorical gatekeepers of the deep structure psyche. Part two is an original dialectic with Steve and Pauline about how someone can begin to resolve complexes, the preparation needed to give the best possible foothold for personal development or working with complexes clinically. Part three is a narration of 16 posts by Steve Richards from our Young to Live By Discord, all prompted by questions asked by admirably dedicated members of our server who are working very hard on their own journeys. If you'd like to join us, there's a link in the description. Steve has written thousands of posts, all of which are instantly available. Comprehensive timestamps are in the description. Allow this video to be a hyperlinked handbook, something to return to in chunks as and when you feel you'd like to. Without any further ado, let us begin. Whenever we speak on complexes, specifically Janaean complexes, a distinction which will become clear later on, then we are speaking about the psychology of the ego. The ego consists of two parts, the Miller number and the self-concept. The Miller number is our immediate consciousness, our subjective, reflexive, moment-to-moment, -moment, phenomenological state of awareness, with a processing capacity of seven plus or minus two chunks of information. This figure derives from the classic paper on screen authored by the cognitive psychologist George Miller in 1956. As Steve writes in IPSA Collected Works Volume 1, in psychosystems analysis the Miller number is the focus of the field of consciousness, as described by Jung in following Pierre Janet, with the field as such 
extending into relative dynamic valences of subconsciousness, and finally into true unconsciousness relative to the Miller number. The wider part of the ego, then, many magnitudes larger than the Miller number, is the self-concept. It represents all information we have accrued across our timeline, that we can dynamically relate to as being us, both implicitly and reflexively. That is, it's our autobiographical memory, all of our learning, and our innate qualities of character. It is the essence of personal identity. The self-concept is systematised into complexes around lifespan trajectory experiences. The vast majority are what Steve and Pauline define as non-aligned. That is, they are functionally inert and unconscious with respect to the ego. They are part of the normal structure of our learning and, through using dialectical syncretism, our long-term memory and the so-called cognitive unconscious of cognitive neuroscience. As Steve writes, quote, non-aligned complexes differ from truly consolidated or non-declarative memory and learning in that they are dynamic in the depth psychology sense of being capable of autonomous action. This includes forming ramified systems of association between themselves and other taxa of complexes. Many non-aligned complexes are also outside of the self-concept entirely, being a part of the unconscious proper. They don't have to be part of the self-concept at all, but for today's video, we'll only focus on those which are. A smaller quantity of the total number of complexes in the self-concept are identified with. For a healthy person, most of these are positive with respect to adaptation and are responsible for the homeostatic regulation of the self-concept. For example, they represent the skills that we use every day and implicitly identify as having. Whether that be specialist knowledge for our job, driving a car, reading, writing or cooking a favourite meal, all, at core, are part of complexes which are autonomous with respect to the ego. Their informational content is far too great to fit within the Miller number, which is usually focused on perceiving the world. That is, we don't generate their content ex nihilo every single time we use them from a conscious act of will. Thus, they are represented by Genean subsystems, or complexes, that boot online and implicitly inform and animate us, either when specifically needed, state dependent, or they keep us on autopilot from one part of the day to the next, state independent. This implicit nature of their relationship to the ego is why they are classified as identified. The ego does not challenge them and sees them as being itself. To help us see the difference between non-aligned and identified, let's take the example of a skill which we haven't used in many years perhaps riding a bike. This is very likely to be represented as non-aligned, that is, inert and unconscious with respect to the ego. When the time arises where it could come in useful again, so we want to ride a bike again, the self-concept is fully capable of accessing its stored informational representation from across our timeline and utilising its positive perseveration to bring it forward from non-aligned to identified. Suddenly, we can ride a bike again, and implicitly identify as being able to do so. Hence, in psychosystems analysis, no complex is considered as truly inaccessible, non-declarative memory. Empirical experience from Steve and Pauline show that such a neuroscientific category is likely an artefact of the fact that non-aligned complexes are both unconscious with respect to the ego, and can operate autonomously. In reality, we can alter them through the psychodynamic process of the moving taxa, through updating our skills, or through allowing them to simply decay over time. 
There is a third and final taxa of Genean complex that we can bring in now. Aligned. With these, the ego is aware of their existence, but does not identify with them as being part of its tacit self-concept. Aligned complexes are in a state of discriminated association to the ego, and very often vary in a waveform pattern across time in magnitude of activity. When we come to speak on the nature of pathological complexes, it will be important to bear in mind that the aligned taxa very often cause the most conscious distress to an individual. This is because they impress upon the ego with a certain quanta of energy, but they are not fully integrated. An example of this is an aspirational ideal, a standard that we compare ourselves to but do not reach, which may have a positive motivational quality to it, but at the same time it saps energy from the ego, as it's always critical of the ego's current state. In this example, the aligned complexes in question would be associated to the moral complex, or superego, which we've spoken on in previous videos. Whilst we're exploring the self-concept, it's worthwhile to give a mention to the persona. The nucleus of the persona is a specialised complex within the field of consciousness. Everybody has one. It's informed by our learning and informs our behaviour autonomously. That is, not through an act of conscious will. The dynamics of the persona are very often state-dependent, varying based on immediate psychosocial variables, and it can become temporarily modified in real time by the activity of other active complexes within the self-concept. As Steve writes, quote, The persona, as a psychosocial interface system, is properly understood as being co-created by our social interactions, and by our intentionality to act in the world. Much that is learned psychosocially is committed to long-term memory, and to complexes that have formed around our experiences. Motivational drives play a part, but overall we are not usually invested enough in terms of ego consciousness, and its limited capacity miller number, to be fully conscious of our persona, as the membrane interface between ourselves and the world. Someone can be relatively completely unconscious of their persona, either through it being identified with, hence not normally demanding of reflexive examination, or through its core being further away in valence from the ego. This, then, is our map of the self-concept, as defined by Steve and Pauline. In short, it represents the through-line and continuity of self over time, including everything that has accrued around it, both positive and negative, and intrinsic and extrinsic. In short, we can think of it as our default setting, in terms of reflexivity. The self-concept is overwhelmingly unconscious, most of the time, with respect to the Miller number. However, its complexes are conscious unto themselves. One way of relating to what this means is through Pierre Janet's concept of the subconscious, put forward in his 1889 PhD thesis, Psychological Automatism, which had an enormous impact on the psychological sciences and Carl Jung. Being a philosopher, psychologist, psychotherapist, and, from 1893 onwards, a medical physician, Janet's work explored the structure of the mind from a clinical perspective. His formative psychological investigations, from 1883 to 1888, were for the purposes of studying, quote, human activity in its simplest and most rudimentary forms. To get an angle on what this means, we should note that many of his peers at the time considered such rudimentary forms, that is, activities pertaining to the unconscious, as being simply mechanically automatic. That is, everything that was not immediately identified as conscious, as per, for example, the Cartesian awareness of thinking, 
was instead purely mechanical, not conscious. Many people today have the same impression. There is a normal identified with waking consciousness, and then there is the unconscious, lacking consciousness. Jeannet disagreed with this, stating that human beings, of course, had automatic tendencies, but that these were simultaneously psychological, and hence conscious in their own way. Through working with various hypnotic methods on individuals suffering badly from psychosomatic neurosis, or hysteria at the time, he created via observation his own theory of the mind, which would lay the indispensable foundation for Jung's much later theory of complexes, described in detail in the second volume of his collected works, Experimental Researches and therefore, too, the theory of complexes in psychosystems analysis. Janet described the psychological automatisms he was investigating, non-willed phenomena, as being subconscious, that is, not unconscious, nor at the focus of the field of consciousness, as he termed it. Instead, they were dissociated from normal consciousness, but nevertheless had a form of consciousness of their own. He noticed that at the root of the suffering of those he worked with was invariably something he termed subconscious fixed ideas. These usually formed at some point in the past due to a dissociation caused by a traumatic or an otherwise very frightening experience, always due to mental weakness in his terms, which would then remain as a source of persistent mental weakness. In psychosystems analysis, this would be described as ego strength. Stephen Pauline would describe this as a state of lowered ego strength being the initial condition for a complex to form, and reciprocally, the pathological complex activity weakens ego strength in the present. Hence why Stephen Pauline have stated that a proper relationship to the self-concept is the sine qua non of ego strength, and that ego strength is the sine qua non of working with the psyche. In addition, Janet's subconscious fixed ideas were, crucially, dynamic. Very often, a patient would present with an initial subconscious fixed idea, which acted as a magnet for many other associations to form. Then, in varying levels of subconsciousness, between the clear consciousness of the person and their constitutional makeup, there were very often a whole array of subconscious fixed ideas, each one originating at a given point within the person's life. They could undergo changes, slow or rapid, or otherwise become modified within the subconscious. Hence, they are both dynamic and autonomous, another essential discovery into the field of complexes. Of course, Janet's concept of the subconscious fixed idea and the psychosystems analysis use of the term complexes are not synonymous, as our understanding of how they operate has moved on significantly since Janet's day, but we can clearly see the core of the idea is exactly the same, having its foundation in Janet. Dissociated, dynamic, autonomous, conscious unto themselves, agents of neurosis that were formed by challenging personal experiences across the timeline. To return to our schema then, it is clear that not all of these complexes will be adaptive. Everyone, whether obviously neurotic or not, would have picked up maladaptive complexes across their timeline. In psychosystems analysis, complexes of all kinds are biopsychosocial field phenomena. That is, they have informational representation in biology, psychology, and psychosocial relationships. And taking a higher resolution look, every collapse of the objective waveform of information, from the platonic field all the way up to the culture. Steve and Pauline's model of complexes represents by far the most refined in the field today and it's backed up by a rich tradition dating back formally 
to the 1880s. The first glimpse of their biopsychosocial nature can be seen as implicit, though not highlighted, by Janet, whereby subconscious fixed ideas usually took hold due to psychosocial pressure, and then presented with both psychological and biological symptoms, as per so-called hysteria. Then, as Steve writes in a recent bulletin report for the International Neuropsychoanalysis Society, published by Rootledge, quote, Jung's early experimental work had clearly demonstrated the Genean dissociability of consciousness, with the simultaneous representation of this now partitioned consciousness at the psychophysiological and psychosocial levels of expressed symptomology and maladaptive functioning. Jung developed the concept of the complex from the associative psychology of Theodor Zeehan, and from Joseph Breuer and Sigmund Freud's ideational complexes, to include Janet's subnuclei of consciousness as being empirically demonstrable and clinically treatable in both normal and pathological subjects. Jung's work then on complexes truly highlighted their real-time, dynamic, psychobiological nature. Whilst conducting the word association test protocol, developed by himself and Franz Ricklin, the patient's physiological state was measured using a pneumograph and through monitoring the galvanised skin response. Both psychological and biological variables would shift in accordance with one another, so that the complex's activity profile had a presence in both. There was a brief time in which Freud and Jung were both fully on board with the theory of complexes being key to the progression of neurosis. A key reference for this was the famous Five Lectures on Psychoanalysis, given by Freud at Clark University in the US in 1909, with Jung in attendance. Freud says, quote, it is highly convenient, ladies and gentlemen, to follow the Zurich school, that is Bloiler, Jung, etc., in describing a group of interdependent ideational elements cathected with affect as a complex. We see then that if in our search for a repressed complex in one of our patients, we start out from the last thing he remembers, we shall have every prospect of discovering the complex, provided that the patient puts a sufficient number of his free associations at our disposal. Accordingly, we allow the patient to say whatever he likes, and hold fast to the postulate that nothing can occur to him which is not in an indirect fashion dependent on the complex we are in search of. If this method of discovering what is repressed strikes you as unduly circumstantial, I can at least assure you that it is the only practicable one. And a little later on, Freud says, quote, If you are anxious to gain a rapid and provisional knowledge of a patient's repressed complexes, without as yet entering into their arrangement and interconnection, you will employ, as a method of examination, the association experiment, as it has been developed by Jung and his pupils. So, considering that Freud and Jung were both on board with complexes, what happened? As Steve writes in an International Neuropsychoanalysis Society bulletin, the post-1912 split between Freud and Jung saw Freud drawing back from his previously qualified acceptance of Jung's model of complexes, whilst retaining the Oedipal and castration complexes, and Jung moving away from an emphasis on instincts in favour of his expanded biological and meta-psychological construct of archetypes. Both Freud and Jung progressively distanced themselves from the work of Pierre Janet and in so doing, overlooked developments that would lead to the psychosystems analysis understanding of the Janaean dissociation of consciousness, hypnosis, and the mind-body superpositioning of informational states as extended fields of consciousness amenable to therapeutic intervention and change. 
So, as we've seen so far, Steve and Pauline's theory of complexes is inspired and informed both by the early work of Janet and by Carl Jung. In addition, a very important note is the work of the late Professor Ernest Rossi, a Freudian and Jungian analyst, and the closest student of Milton Erickson. He developed his own concept in the tradition of complexes, which he called state-dependent memory, learning and behaviour, or SDMLB. Rossi elucidated the very specific psychobiological pathways through which these SDMLBs operate, which includes the psychoneuroendocrine and the psychoneuroimmune systems of the body. His work demonstrably showed that complexes act as whole system state encoders, with their information flow throughout the body being mediated by what he termed messenger molecules, neurotransmitters, neuropeptides, and hormones, principally. In other words, the psychological profile of the complex depends on the state of the body, and through addressing either, the other will reciprocally shift. Let's have a look at the schema Rossi frequently used across his publications, the mind-body loop. He considered there to be four stages of a mind-body cycle of communication, and I'll quote from his paper, The Genomic Science Foundation of Body Psychotherapy, published in 2004. He describes these four stages as such. 1. Information from the outside world encoded in the neurons of the cerebral cortex of the brain which is then transformed within the limbic hypothalamus pituitary system in the messenger molecules that travel through the bloodstream to signal receptors on all cells. So, in short, psychosocial information has presence within the brain, which is then transduced into messenger molecules. Two, the receptors on the surface of cells transmit the signal via secondary messengers to the nucleus of the cell where immediate early genes signal other target genes to transcribe their code into messenger RNAs. So, these messenger molecules released by the brain and bind to cells kickstart an intracellular signaling cascade with a telic trajectory towards modulating gene transcription. 3. The messenger RNAs serve as blueprints for the synthesis of proteins that will function as either the ultimate healing structures, the soma of the body, enzymes to facilitate energy dynamics, and receptors and messenger molecules for the informational dynamics of the cell. So RNA is translated into protein, which one can consider, though this is an oversimplification for explanation, the active form of DNA. This protein then carries out specific tasks. 4. Messenger molecules function as a type of molecular memory that can evoke state-dependent memory, learning and behaviour (SDMLBs) in the neural networks of the brain that are encoded and transformed by body psychotherapy, illustrated as the rectangular array of letters A to L at the top. So finally, the messenger molecules are released once again from the somatic cells and make their way back to the brain and state encode the neurological, and hence psychological by extension, activity of the SDMLB. As you can clearly see in Rossi's framework, mind and body are inseparable, and hence, implicitly, complexes, as his SDMLBs, are shown not just to be biopsychosocial phenomena, but their specific transduction pathways are elucidated in molecular detail. Rossi was highly effective at using hypnosis to specifically target certain psychobiological symptoms and states in order to alleviate the activity of SDMLBs. He was an inspiration to Steve and Pauline, and he personally supported their development of psychosystems analysis, including working with them on highly complicated clinical cases implicated with significant psychobiological symptoms. In 1990, at Charing Cross Hospital in London, Steve and Pauline introduced clinical capnography 
and the Charing Cross method into NHS primary healthcare, specifically the psychotherapy, hypnotherapy, counselling and stress management provisions. Pauline had already been using capnography in psychiatry since 1989. Capnography was, and still is, a highly effective means of diagnosing hyperventilation and burnout syndrome. For reference, on screen are three textbooks on the subject, from 2002, 2011 and 2014. Capnography works like this. Using infrared mass spectrometry, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the breath during exhalation is measured and converted via an algorithm into a value that represents the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood. CO2 in the blood is in the form of carbonic acid, which takes part in the blood's pH buffering system. This is kept at a very tight value of pH 7.4. As someone breathes in and out, the concentration of CO2 in the blood ever so slightly shifts and the homeostatic buffer manages this by dynamically shifting the pH back to its equilibrium point, 7.4. If the buffer capacity is completely overloaded, then immediate death results. It needs to be kept at 7.4. However, like everything pertaining to biology, there is a range of values around 7.4 that blood pH can take. This is where capnography comes in as a diagnostic tool. Hyperventilation is defined as a state of breathing beyond the body's physiological needs. This can be overt, such as someone obviously breathing in and out rapidly, but it need not present like this at all. It is common, albeit unhealthy, for someone to appear as if breathing normally, when really they're breathing beyond what they need. Hyperventilation causes a reduction in carbonic acid in the blood, as you breathe off too much CO2, which ever so slightly shifts the equilibrium point of blood pH towards alkalosis. So the value rises. This causes a whole potential array of symptoms, from relatively common and harmless paresthesia to potentially fatal coronary artery spasm depending on the cardiovascular health of the person and the degree of alkalosis. The medical literature is rich with its use as a medical diagnostic tool. However, until Steve and Pauline's original clinical empiricism, leading to its integration with a specifically psychodynamic model of complexes, capnography was fundamentally used in biomedical and cognitive behavioural contexts. By using clinical capnography in conjunction with hypnosis, Steve and Pauline noticed that the partial pressure of CO2 would rise and fall in immediate accordance with the patient's psychological state, revealing not just their background physiological variables, but the nature of their complexes too. Let's explore this with a real case study. On screen is a capnogram from a case conducted by Steve and Pauline on the 22nd of July 1991 with a female patient of 27 years of age. The x-axis shows time running from right to left with each segment like this marking two minutes. So this whole capnography session took approximately 29 minutes. The y-axis shows the percentage of CO2, with each percentage corresponding to a value of 7.6 millimetres of mercury. The lower the millimetres of mercury, the more CO2 the person is breathing off, which, as we've said, is a direct indicator of the blood pH shifting towards alkalosis, hence a marker of hyperventilation, breathing beyond the body's physiological needs. At the time this case was conducted, any value less than 29 millimetres of mercury was considered frank hypercapnia, with the normal range being 35 to 40. Steve and Pauline consider this too harsh a cutoff, but regardless of this, it is very clear to see just at a glance that this individual's CO2 is fluctuating chaotically, 
with the vast majority well beneath any reasonable cutoff point for frank hypercapnia. Wherever you see dark shading, this is indicative of rapid breathing. The chart strip pen was moving so fast in correspondence to the breath cycle that it was literally just writing over itself. If we start from the right hand side, this point here shows the first breath detected by the capnograph. In this initial rest period, so just the capnograph detecting breathing at rest, you can see that the CO2 more or less immediately dropped into chaos, so this individual was clearly hypercapnic at rest. This state, on its own, is sufficient for many psychosomatic symptoms to develop and progress. Then, as was standard practice at the time, though Steve and Pauline soon after dropped it completely, as it isn't needed, the patient was asked to go through a forced hyperventilation provocation test for two minutes. The purpose of this was to sensitise the person to hyperventilation for a brief period of time, so that what would otherwise be very small changes in CO2 would be magnified in value making psychophysiological rate of change easier to detect. As you can see, as expected, the CO2 drops, literally because they are hyperventilating. The patient is then asked to report when their breathing feels normal again. That's the MBIN, my breathing is normal, in the notes at the bottom. They say their breathing is normal here, despite a frank hypercapnic CO2 reading meaning that they were positive for what was called failure of perception of hypocapnia. In other words, this CO2 should not be felt as normal. Hence, this is indicative of a level of dissociation. A failure of perception of hypercapnia was synonymous for Charing Cross at the time with the sensitization that was aimed for through the forced hyperventilation provocation test. However, Steve and Pauline found, as we mentioned a moment ago, that the test wasn't needed. Therefore, it is entirely possible, through the psychodynamic process of dissociation, for someone to believe that their breathing is normal, when in fact it clearly isn't, without any need for forced hyperventilation to try and draw these results out. So, wherever you see MBIN on screen, you're seeing dissociation. Then Steve moves into the think test. This is exactly what it sounds like. The patient is asked to think about a certain aspect or occurrence in their lives, selected before the session, and the psychophysiological response is measured by the capnograph. For the first think test, trouble at work, the CO2 value rises away from the restored baseline, being no longer chaotic, but then the breathing starts to grow rapid, and the chaotic pattern of breathing returns. Then they're asked to report when their breathing is normal, marked here. Then the second think test, for parents. Again, you see a fall in CO2, followed by a brief rise, then a fall, before the patient is asked to report when they feel their breathing is normal again. This section, interestingly, also picks up a breath-holding pattern from the patient, represented here by an incomplete line, literally an unfinished breath. Then, for the final think test, abortion, there was a massive collapse in CO2 value, marking a strong abreaction. You can see the continued fall all the way down to beneath 7.6 millimetres of mercury. Charing Cross would have said this person was at immediate risk of coronary artery spasm or any number of potentially fatal cardiovascular events, like stroke. The think test for abortion had revealed very starkly that the etiology of her complex, causing the respiratory alkalosis, was an abortion that she had had, which she had been unable to understand at the level of instinct. The dissociation between genomic pressure and the ego had created a psychobiological state, very similar to what we saw when looking at Rossi's work a moment ago, which was literally synonymous with the formation 
of a nucleus of a complex. Instead of being homeostatically cleared away, the stress of the abortion had perseverated from ego consciousness, and remained, like a Genean subconscious fixed idea. Albeit, as is very clear to see, complexes are not just ideas. They are full biopsychosocial states. This state was fully activated by the mention of abortion. To restore the patient's breathing back to normal, Steve began a hypnotic induction, which you can see start here. Immediately, there's a huge rise in CO2, back up to roughly the patient's resting value, followed by a brief period of chaos as the abreaction perseverates, de facto attempting to resist the hypnosis. Then the hypnosis kicks in, and you can see that trance state maintained for five minutes, with by far the most normal, regular breathing on the chart strip recorder. The hypnosis had encouraged homeostasis, turning the acute complex state off, and she was back to normal. In the left-hand side results box, you can see that this individual was positive for chronicity or arrhythmia in breathing, positive for failure of perception of hypercapnia, positive for all three of the think tests, and positive for presenting symptoms. The pattern of the chart strip recorder, in accordance with what was asked of the patient, reveals the complexes involved in this person's state of resting hypercapnia and hyperventilation their overall resultant suggestibility, how vulnerable they were, and most importantly, as shown by the hypnosis period, their capacity to heal. The case was ultimately successful, with the complexes resolved and the physiology returned back to health. It's clear to see how powerful capnography is for identifying the psychophysiological background state of an individual. Indeed, how powerful hypnosis is for bringing forward homeostasis against the inertia of complexes, rapidly. Given what we know about this person's background state, it is worthwhile to imagine what might have happened had they sought out exposure therapy instead. It is very likely that this fall in CO2 here would easily have occurred. It would have gone undetected except being noted as an abreaction, and hence it would have been unmanaged, potentially leading to their death, either immediately or through a perseveration a few days or weeks later. Most complexes, of course, are not this potentially life-threatening, but the important thing is, some are. Without an understanding of their biopsychosocial nature, and a proper understanding of how hypnosis can be used to deal with them, it is fair to say that therapists who claim to work with complexes are flying completely blind. Another observation Steve and Pauline made through clinical empiricism with the capnograph, which is easy to visualise, is that sometimes when a patient was asked to recall something which their case history indicated would generate a fall in CO2, paradoxically, the CO2 would rise instead. Without an understanding of psychodynamics, this observation would be impossible to explain. Steve and Pauline explain this phenomenon as a witnessing of a complex's defence mechanism, as a biological readout in real time. That is, something is capable of meta-regulating the blood pH. Something is actively resisting the natural fall despite the homeostasis of the blood buffering capacity being temporarily overwhelmed by the hyperventilation. Something outside of homeostasis has its own homeostasis it metaphorically tries to maintain. This, of course, is a biopsychosocial complex. Thus, taking all of this together, Steve and Pauline discovered that blood pH is one of the most potent state encoders and regulators of complex activity. They presented their findings at the 12th International Symposium on Respiratory Psychophysiology at the Wellcome Centre in London on the 23rd of September 
1993. Complexes can initially form during conditions of weakened ego strength, such as burnout caused by hyperventilation, and then reciprocally act to maintain that state, as complexes are that dissociated state, with all the psychological and psychosocial material accrued to it. Thus, when working to resolve complexes, the energetic health of the body must crucially be taken into account, with a particular focus on restorative sleep. This is represented at IPSA by the Charing Cross Method, which we've discussed in previous videos. The early pioneers into psychosomatic transduction, like Janet, Freud and Breuer, all worked with patients with something called, back then, neurasthenia, along with, of course, many other conditions. This neurasthenia was a state of fatigue, anxiety, depressive mood, and other somatic symptoms, like headaches and heart palpitations. Janet later preferred a term he coined to describe the same state, psychasthenia, to emphasise that this syndrome had a psychological etiology rather than a neurological one. So as we'd say today, psychological factors transducing into the body. It is worth considering, as Steve has pointed out before, the understanding that Janet could have made about psychasthenia, and therefore complexes, if he would have had access to capnography. He would undoubtedly have seen that blood pH as a somatic state could be regulated by both mechanical hyperventilation and by complexes. What he would have called subconscious fixed ideas. So we have seen that complexes are clearly best described as biopsychosocial phenomena, with their own dynamic homeostasis that they metaphorically try and maintain. When pathological, their setup instructions always run contrary to the telic intentionality of the lifespan. They always aim for equilibrium that is best represented by a past ego state. As a field representation of information, they can be visualised as being out of phase with the overall homeostatic objective waveform of information. Just like electromagnetic waves, the out of phase complexes will have their own discrete profile, that is, the activity of the complex, and this will automatically interfere with the presentation of total waveform topology. The peaks will interfere with peaks, and troughs with troughs, so that, as shown diagrammatically, very often the whole of the person's life is affected, and the potential of the person is in conflict with its total, available, free energy. One field informational representation to definitely note is their clear Sheldrakean aspect. Steve and Pauline have observed that complexes, as a form, are a discrete material representation of a discrete nested taxa of morphic field, meaning just as human behaviour is subject to formative causation, as per Dr. Rupert Sheldrake's model, so too are complexes. Steve and Pauline have witnessed many times that the complexes of people who they had never met before seemed to recognise them straight away more and more as their decades of clinical experience progressed. It's as if complexes had a shared form-based memory impression of their previous encounters with them, or at least with therapists as such. This extends to something essential discussed in our recent Terminal Lucidity and Rebirth series. The current field strength of certain complexes is bolstered by the influence of Sheldrakean formative causation. That is, the stronger the collective complex field, the more likely someone is to find themselves caught in it, even when controlling for the influence of cultural suggestion. On the flip side, the reverse is equally true. The more people do the right thing, and disconnect from the catabolic field, the easier it will become for others, who are not directly associated to the immediate fields of those people, to disconnect. Complexes can thus be seen 
as field parasites, nourishing themselves off of the total free energy of the individual and collective, superpositioned together. We've spoken in great detail about the dynamics of complexes, but how do they form in the first place? We know so far that dissociation under conditions of lowered ego strength is the ground state. Let's build on this as we explore Steve and Pauline's full elucidated mechanism. Human beings, like all animals, are under adaptive pressure from the environment. Specifically, with us, our psychosocial world, which is by far the most complex out of any species on the planet. Crucially, too, we're also under adaptive pressure from within. That is, the genome is always producing instinct, with the telic intentionality for its release into the world. The ego's proper role is to feel this instinctive intent, equivalent to Freud's pleasure principle, and allow its release into the world in an adaptive fashion, Freud's reality principle. A healthy ego thus has a conscious relationship to instinct. Dissociation comes in, then, as an evolved means of preserving the tight homeostatic boundaries of the self-concept, under conditions of significant adaptive pressure. Like any discrete structure, the ego needs to be protected. When that protection needs to be immediate, such as from immense instinctive pressure initiated by a stressful environment, then dissociation is the means by which this takes place. As Janet noted, dissociation of the field of consciousness is a normal, healthy phenomenon. It's quite common for many people to mildly dissociate at different times of the day. Drifting off into a daydream or a reverie whilst being tired is perhaps the easiest to notice. In psychosystems analysis, when the ego spontaneously dissociates, in order to protect itself, then this is called partitioning of the ego. To preserve the integrity of the self-concept, the ego devolves responsibility for dealing with an unresolved situation or conflict over to a subsystem of itself. Not a full complex, but an active partition of ego consciousness, independent to the Miller number, nonetheless. This is common, especially when ego strength is lower, such as is the case, for example, with children. Natural homeostasis, especially through restorative sleep, tends to clear away many of these partitions soon after they form, so that they don't remain longer than needed. However, if the ego voluntarily suppresses or unconsciously represses this Janaean partition, then it is likely to go on to form a full, stable complex. As Steve writes in IPSA Collected Works Volume 1, quote, suppression in this context defines the ego's partitioning of itself as a conscious act of will. Having devolved responsibility to a subset of itself, the ego then gradually moves into a state of normal memory consolidation, as it forgets what it has done in setting up the complex. Complexes require free energy, or libido, to operate as part of the overall energetic and metabolic economy of the organism. The loading is not significant until the complex in question transitions from being suppressed into repressed. Repression in this context means that the complex has escaped from being broken down into free energy, so deconstructed by natural homeostasis, or transitioned into a dormant, with respect to the ego, non-aligned state. Consolidation into long-term memory, too, has failed. Instead, repression has meant that the complex has retained the brief that it was created for, to defend the ego. But lacking regulatory contact from the ego, it's now in a state of full autonomy. An independent psychodynamic system that will act to defend itself and its setup instructions, as laid down by the conditions 
under which it was originally created. Suppression, then into repression, is the most common route by which a Janaean partition continues on its ontology into becoming a complex. However, it is important to note that this is not always the case. Sometimes only repression is involved, depending on the immediate conditions in which it formed and the ego strength of the person. Regardless, the psychodynamic ontology is clear and definitive. So, given the formation of a complex, what happens then? Steve continues in IPSA Collected Works Volume 1, quote, Autonomous complexes will act against the ego if the ego contradicts their set-up instructions, which are now repressed from ego consciousness. The result can be a psychological autoimmune attack on the ego, which then experiences a powerful neurosis, literally being at war with itself. Complexes can also act to cap instinct and redirect their libido, or drive, to ensure that they are sustained at cost to the ego. Instinctive pressure will push harder to get through, and the ego will feel both the force of that and of the unconscious but autonomous action of the complex. This unfortunate state of affairs is a byproduct of our evolution, a trade off from a moment of maximized potential for survival, which is the purpose of ego partitioning, at the expense of living out full genomic potential. An active pathological complex is always in the identified or aligned taxa. If identified, this does not mean that the ego is conscious of them. In fact, the ego is most likely to be unconscious of them, as identified complexes are the least likely to be reflexively examined, being considered implicitly part of personal identity. If they are aligned, then the ego is conscious of their presence, but is still impressed upon by them. Regardless of taxa, pathological complexes will fight to maintain their homeostasis, fundamentally to keep their role of defending the ego. Steve and Pauline have observed that they do this through many common means, including attempting to shift into the identified taxa, reconstituting past ego state adaptations to maintain their innovation by instinct, co-opting cognition so that thinking through a problem leads towards their confirmation, slipping into conversation for someone else to confirm their purpose and role, and many more. Regarding this last one, when a person passively allows a complex to speak through them, and those words remain unchallenged, then the complex has de facto confirmed itself. See, the other person implicitly agrees with what you've just said. There's value to it, therefore. I have use, therefore. Because pathological complexes form through this specific Darwinian ontology, they tend to have a higher valency than our gradually built-up so-called positive complexes, such as our skills. They have more potency and more easily disrupt us than can their positive counterparts inform us or animate us. Now we know how complexes form and their dynamics of action, let's move into some immediate practicalities. How can someone become more conscious of their self-concept, and therefore their complexes? After all, the self-concept is overwhelmingly unconscious most of the time. So, what can someone do? As a comprehensive area of potential reflexivity, let's explore the appearance and role of complexes within dreams. Jung stated that complexes were the architects of dreams. We know today that this is not true. How could Janaean complexes possibly have the resources to produce a dream? Active complexes are always localised to the field of ego consciousness, and thus are relatively superficial compared to the metaphorical depths of the psyche. 
The truth is, as an essential insight from Steve and Pauline, just as the dreamer cannot resist being pulled into a dream narrative, neither can complexes, if they are of the identified taxa. The dreamer is obliged to read a script. So too are the identified complexes. Why is this the case, though? Steve writes in IPSA Collected Works Volume 1, quote, Dream narrative experiences involve a transition between the ego's self-referent identity in a waking state to that of being fully immersed in the dream. The self-concept provides continuity between those two states. In a dream state, the dream ego therefore identifies with the waking ego. Everyone can pressure test and explore this with their own dreams. In a dream, we feel like ourselves. The I of self-referent identity is still present. Minus the reflexivity of waking ego consciousness, the dream ego acts out and experiences a clear and rigid emphasis on a certain part or parts of the self-concept, as evident in the dream settings, characters or experiences that unfold. Hence, those complexes which we identify with as being us, both implicit parts of the self-concept and Genean complexes, are drawn into the dream narrative, because the self-concept is shared in common between the waking ego and the dream ego, with the latter identifying with the former. By means of a quick note, Steve and Pauline have stated that the phenomenon of lucid dreams, whereby the dreamer is supposedly conscious and has creative agency over how a dream plays out, is very likely to be, as evidenced by the identification of the dreamer with their dreaming experiences, the result of the waking ego identifying with the dream ego. So, the reverse of what we said a moment ago. That is, the apparent presence of control is not real, but instead a metaphorical narrative device to emphasise a certain qualia of pertinence of the meaning of the dream for the waking ego. So, in a dream, there's the dream ego and some of the ego's identified complexes. Both are actors, reading from a script handed to them by a metaphorical producer, director and scriptwriter. As Steve and Pauline have said via analogy, the producer is the whole field of information that composes the person. The director is homeostasis. Working together, the producer and director produce and direct dreams, therefore under the telic intentionality of homeostasis, specific for that person. The metastructure of dreams is adaptive intent. It follows that the scriptwriter is gene expression, literally the transcription of homeostatic intent into psychobiological information that can reveal and carry out that intent. In other words, instinct, adapted around the current state of the ego. This is then acted out by the dream ego and its identified complexes. Thus, as Steve writes, quote, the instinctive scenarios of dream narratives are part of a natural homeostatic regulatory process, offering a reworking of associations and metabolic breaking down of complexes. Is this all there is in dreams, however? Not quite. There's one more topic to cover before we move into the dialectic part of this video. It's time to move into the non-ego psyche and explore the other type of complex identified by Steve and Pauline. Not Genean, as we've discussed so far, but deep structure. In psychosystems analysis, there are two broad categories of instinct, panksepian and meta. 
The former are largely synonymous with what common parlance normally designates as instinct. Inherited patterns of relatively simple behaviour which meet organic needs. Named after the pioneering affective neuroscientist, the late Professor Yak Pangseb, this class of instinct is conserved across our phylogeny to such an extent that all mammals share them in common. Through Pangseb's work, we know that their representation within neuroscience clusters into seven discrete circuits. Seeking, play, lust, care, rage, panic, and fear. In the words of Professor Mark Solms, these, quote, extend organic homeostasis beyond the body. They are absolutely crucial for survival, reproduction, and rudimentary social engagement. However, these seven basic emotional systems do not describe the entirety of the deep structure psyche. Evolving in lockstep with the ego to deal with continued psychosocial adaptation across the lifespan are Steve and Pauline's concept of the meta-instincts. This shares a cultural genealogy with Freud's archaic remnants and the implicit presence of an instinctive narrative within his model of the Oedipus complex, and also Jung's theory of archetypes, including all of the influences on it right the way back to Plato. Meta-instincts are produced from the genome, and after any modification from Sheldrakean field effects, organise the narrative structure of our lifespan. They don't fire out onto immediate stimuli or opportunities, like Pangsepian instincts do, but rather adapt us to the arc of life itself. In short, meta-instincts give the human context for the Pangsepian instincts. Pangsepian instincts can never be switched off. Once they develop to maturity in adolescence, they're there to stay. Meta-instincts, in stark contrast, are progressively released instead rehearsing themselves ahead of time in the play of children, and in spontaneous imagination. This is crucial. Because adaptation is always the intentionality of the genome, the relative release of meta-instincts in the context of a person's life is always the decisive factor in how successful this is. If we return to dreams for a moment, both class of instinct are present in the dream's narrative structure. In addition, meta-instincts can take on the form of a character, an image, an actor just like the ego and its identified complexes. However, not as straightforwardly. How we interpret and relate to this is decisive for personal development. In pop Jungian psychology, certain images of this kind are often described as being archetypes. The wise old man, the anima, the animus, the self, etc. When encountered online or in the culture, however, they are nothing more than collective representations, completely and obviously detached from one's personal ecology. Images of this kind only get imbued with significance via projective identification, which, if not worked through dialectically, very often remains as a fantasy trap, putting the ego's development in stasis. Hence, Jung dropped his famous habit of drawing mandalas, after his Liverpool is the pool of life dream in 1925, which we've previously made a video on. Let it be said, Images in the culture are not archetypes, or meta-instincts. If images of this kind, so-called archetypal images, spontaneously appear within, however, this is a different story. Jung considered archetypes, analogous here to meta-instincts, to be inexperienceable, except through the archetypal images which they produced. In psychosystems analysis, however, the archetypal image is the archetype, albeit in a superpositioned state, 
via representational psychodynamics. For Jung, we can experience the image and only infer where it came from. In psychosystems analysis, because of Steve and Pauline's model of the superpositioning of information, the image is the instinct it ontologically arose from. It isn't a linear A causes B, but rather the informational substrate of A is conserved and modified in B. That is superpositioning. This is crucial to understand as it gives a framework for practically relating to the deep structure psyche, as and when it spontaneously presents itself. So this begs the question, what exactly is an image or character of this kind within a dream? That is an instinctive image, not the dream ego or its identified complexes, but something representing meta-instinctive information, and hence crucial for adaptation. Well, as an actor, it's still obliged to read the script handed to it by the producer, director, and scriptwriter. If we decided to abstract the image out from the dream, clearly it loses all of its context. By analogy, the same is true of characters in a movie. As Steve has said before, if we remove Gandalf from Lord of the Rings and dropped him into a soap opera scenario, he'd be related to by this new context in a completely different way. He'd cease to be a guide to Frodo and instead become a strange joke. Thus, an image can never encapsulate the entirety of an archetype or meta-instinct. The image is always superpositioned with it, but is not self-contained. It always needs a context. This context, the narrative, plus the image or character, represents the net superpositioning of the meta-instinct within a dream or piece of creativity, always taking on a representational form that the ego has a chance to relate to. Now for the final classification of complex. This superpositioning of meta-instinct into a specific representational image is called a deep structure complex. Deep structure complexes, like the Genean complexes we discussed earlier, are formed over the life of an individual, that is, not inherited. Hence, they are complexes. Genean complexes originate in the ego through dissociation, ego partitioning, then consolidation into an autonomous agent of neurosis. Deep structure complexes do not. They are much deeper in the psyche, metaphorically beneath the ego, facing up towards it, and superpositioned with a meta-instinct. They are in dynamic homeostasis with both the meta-instinct and the self-concept of the ego, so that its current representational form depends on both. The meta-instinctive component represents the genome's anticipation of its own unfolding across lifespan development, with the top face meeting the ego where the ego is currently at, in terms of development, maturity, insight and understanding. So deep structure complexes are dialectical mediators of information between the ego and the instinctive psyche. Their existence is for the purpose of learning more about ourselves so that we can make positive progress in our adaptation. This always has to be incremental so that the homeostasis of the self-concept is maintained. Hence, we cannot just look inside and access undistilled meta-instinct. Not normally, anyway. It would be too much, and the ego wouldn't learn anything except be overwhelmed by affect, not having gone through the necessary steps of insight to utilise it. When we look inside, then, we first of all see our own self-concept, with its identified complexes. Going deeper, 
we will meet with a deep structure complex. These always mirror back to the ego what the non-ego psyche, the so-called unconscious, genome, or wider field of information, thinks about the ego. It's metaphorically saying, look, this is what you are like. This is what you're doing to yourself. Here's an angle on you. How the ego relates to this is crucial. Steve and Pauline have introduced the psychodynamic of internal projection to describe the tendency of the ego to project itself over the contents of the non-ego psyche. If the ego looks inside and interprets everything it sees as if itself or an extension of itself, then it is internally projecting. The non-ego psyche is not the ego. If someone informed by Pop Jungian theory looks inside or has a dream and sees an evil shadow figure, a radiant anima figure or a mandala so-called self, they're very likely seeing a deep structure complex, mirroring back to the ego what it is from the perspective of the non-ego psyche. In this case, it would be the fact that it is identified with a theory-laden framework saturating the self-concept, which encourages a fantasy escape away from real-world adaptation, something the genome would not see as beneficial whatsoever, and hence needs to be pointed out to the ego through a deep structure complex. To take this as a confirmation of the theory, instead, is internal projection. Instead, the ego should metaphorically empty its cup, as Steve has said, and instead of falling in love with its own reflection, it should be willing to receive information that is truly non-ego, something it can truly learn from, pertaining to its own state and adaptation in the present. Every deep structure complex will change in representation as the ego updates itself. In dreams, we are able to see both our identified Genean complexes and our deep structure complexes. The same is true in states of hypnosis and active imagination. The latter, unfortunately, reifies both class of complex and hence is not recommended. Whereas the former, hypnosis, when conducted properly, allows a natural path to the meta-instincts. Indeed, the same is also true in creativity, in particular creative writing. Just like dreams, complexes are pulled into the weave of the narrative. Deep structure complexes make spontaneous appearances, and the overall thread of the story represents telic activation of meta-instincts, and the resolution of complexes. Now it's time to move on to the dialectic portion of this video, featuring Steve and Pauline Richards, where we discuss how someone can begin to resolve their own complexes. One of the things that's really stuck with me about your guys' model of complexes and how it was developed is that it was clearly developed through practical experience. It wasn't a case of you learned a lot of theory, applied it, it seemed to match the world, and that was that. You built it up progressively through experience. And the same then is true for anyone who's approaching this material clinically or for personal development. Insofar as the theory is great, the theory needs to be understood, but living it out properly and getting that experience for oneself is the crucial point. Without that, there might as well be no theory there at all for someone to know. That really stuck with me when you guys said that before. Thanks, James. So the most important thing to understand is that this is a lived experience that we have to go through which means that the worst preparation for experience is theory theory should come from experience if we do it the other way around in other words if we lead with theory then every experience we have will be filtered through that and we're immediately at some distance from the lived experience of another person and if we're working clinically then the therapeutic relationship itself is determined by the theory but it's not about that 
it's a phenomenological issue. It's about not just presence in a passive way and not just active listening, for example, as you get from many counsellors. It's, it's a complete presence as a field phenomenon. And your theory then is derived from that experience. And you have to critically evaluate your own involvement and engagement with things. Set that against any kind of theory you may have had and then update the theory. So the theory has to continually develop on the basis of experience. Of course, this is difficult at the beginning because none of us start out with having experience. We have to gain it. So some preparation is important. Um, we were discussing before, Paul and I, about how when we began our journey, particularly in frontline healthcare, um, our theory was pure Jungian. And it didn't survive the pressure test of engagement with reality. It had to be revised. The more that we'd have pushed the theory, the more we would have pushed the other person away. That doesn't remove the psychodynamics which are present. They're there regardless of what we believe about ourselves or what we believe or model or whatever it might be, the experience that, that's going on in that room with that person and subjectively within their own psyche and, of course, subjectively within our own. These things are there anyway. Therefore, that's what we should be attempting to understand what is beneath the surface of our cognition, of our theory, even of the situation that we're in, whether that's in frontline healthcare or personal development, social interaction, whatever it might be. What are the true psychodynamics? And if we can't find that, we cannot do anything that's authentic. Yeah, well, I would agree with that completely. Um, theory has to be derived from practice, ultimately. And in all of our clinical practice, and obviously that's quite extensive now mm. for us, we never introduce theory when we're working with someone. Uh, that's something which informs our practice. Of course it does, it's always there in the background, but we're very, very careful about how much we share of that with the person that we're working with. And part of the reason for that, particularly with respect to complexes, is that you, you can just give someone a, lang a language with which to hurt themselves. Yeah. So, you know, complexes are, are opportunistic. They're looking for things all the time to feed themselves and to survive in that, in that metaphorical sense. And so we're, we're very, very careful about what we do and what we say. We have to monitor ourselves all the time on an ongoing basis when we're working clinically with someone. Yeah. And so we tend not to, unless it's absolutely asked for, or it's somebody or, who already say has a background in the model, which can happen. And so, you know, obviously you, you, you have to take that into account. You can't just ask somebody to, to not know what they know because uh, it, it will naturally be there, but it will be utilized by complexes. And sometimes the, the, the more intelligent, the more well-informed somebody is, the more difficult they are to help because there's more for complexes to feed off and to fight back with. So that's a, you know, that's a, something that we, we shy away from doing when we're working clinically is yeah. to actually share the model in full and to discuss the actual processes that are at work. Cause that, that would be, it would have interfere enormously um, simply with the, with the, um, the, the, the field relationship that mm. you have to another person for a start. Mm. So we, we always keep that to ourselves unless it's explicitly asked for, or somebody is already very familiar with it, in which case we have to work with it. Yeah. So the starting point is always the relationship <clears throat> to the field and the field includes yourself, any external person, but also if you're working only on yourself, if it's introspection mm. for personal development, then you're working with, images, representations, um, and dynamics behind those representations, which are continually turning over and re-representing themselves and establishing habits of adaptation or maladaptation. So whichever direction you're looking in, internally to work on yourself, externally to work with others, which always includes your own work, then it's all about relating. How do you relate? Well, first of all, what you have to do is accept that this is an unknown situation and how you react to it being unknown 
is crucial. If you react through a kind of uh, a panic response, I don't feel competent enough to deal with this. That's not good because that's another way in which complexes can intercede in that. Mm. Or do you react with curiosity? Curiosity is an interesting thing because it's connected to the Panksepian seeking system to some extent. But if you're curious about the phenomenon of a relationship to another human being, then what you'll find is that curiosity is picked up. And your own curiosity need not be obvious and intrusive and extroverted. You can signal that by your mere presence. So the field of your own unconscious will be leaching out from you and will meet the unconscious of the other and your curiosity about them and their situation will be detected. At that point in them, things that are not contained within their normal consciousness, their ego, uh, will respond despite what they may do. And that includes the typical defense mechanisms that you get in uh, the analytical traditions. That is a reaction. This, the so-called uh, transference is a reaction. They're all field phenomena. You have to be curious about what is happening. That's the very first step. And you do that with yourself too. You need to have a deep curiosity about what is going on. That's number one. But don't let that curiosity run you. You then have to have a way of understanding and interpreting the field that's the interpersonal field and the intrapersonal field as well. And in order to do that productively, you need ego strength. And ego strength, of course, as you know, we define principally as being homeostasis. That's to say that the ego is doing its job properly. It's functionally uh, balanced and, and in good working order. But it also knows where it begins and where it ends. And if it's unsure about where it begins and where it ends, then it will make a step or should, the ego should make a conscious statement and say, that's the limit of me. I stop at that point externally. Internally, the same. That's me. I can't go any further before. This is actually not me anymore. This is something else which is representing itself to me. So it's the beginning of a conscious separation between self and other extrinsically and self and other than me, intrinsically or internally. That's the beginning of being able to set up a dialogue. If not, if our boundary is disturbed and, and we begin to identify either with things on the outside or the inside, then the ego gets invested by things that don't properly belong within it. And then processes like identification can occur, inflation, definitely neurosis, hysteria, all the usual things can all occur from that because there is a boundary issue internally and or externally. Well, that's a very important point, Steve. Uh, it makes me think uh, of, of our expression, uh, you know, what is within, so too is without, because a lot of complexes form under the, 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 the pressure um, of influence and mm. suggestion from the outside. Mm. And mm. depending on, I guess, how suggestible somebody is to... Um, to outer influences will to some extent determine the extent to which they are under the influence of complexes as well. There tends to be yeah. a, a relationship between those two things. Yeah. So you're absolutely right to talk about discrimination mm -hmm. uh, between ourselves and, and, and others, and also um, eventually discrimination between that which is um, that those parts of us which of our self-concept which are healthy and adapted and those parts which are not and that we might consider mm. to be complexes but either way is the process of discrimination that is going on mm. both within and without and, and back again because it's interactive of course yeah that's a really good point and with respect thanks paul to the uh, the axiom what is within so too is without mm. That's a reversible equation. What is without is also within. Yes. And yeah. that's when we internalize things from the external environment and we then begin to populate our inner world with these representations through what we call internal projection. So it works that way is also the other way, which mm. would be that our nature, what it actually is, will express itself into the world. 
And that's a complicated picture mm -hmm. because who we actually are will always attempt to get past our complexes. And when we meet somebody in a clinical setting, then what we're very often seeing is a fragmented figure to ground relationship for them. The, the figure that they are aware of, that they present with, that youngins would call a persona and probably the more superficial aspects of their ego is not the complete picture, but we see things in the background that may well be complexes. And beyond that, their attempt to become whole and complete and individuated, but it's a fragmented picture and the relationship is fragmented and disjointed. That fragmented picture is, if you like, indicative very much of a classical Genean dissociated field of an individual. So we see the complexes forming and um, acting. We also see the healthy part of them trying to come through. And then we see the Jungian idea of the persona and whatever state that the ego and the self-concept are in. All of that's present within that field. Uh, and so long as we are curious about them, then a person will find it very difficult not to relate to you through one or other channels. Even psychopaths will give themselves away if they think you're curious about them. Clinically, it's another very useful thing that you guys have, have said on this. You always ask the question internally, who is influencing this person? That is so powerful as a clinical tool because you get essentially a follow the libido aspect there so uh, another one of your axioms rather than what is within so too is without is uh i've forgotten it now it's disappeared from my head <laughs> I'll, I'll edit this what is it <laughs> complexes again <laughs> By their libido. Shall you know them? Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't edit it, James. It's, it's, it's actually a, an in vivo, isn't it? Um, it is. It happens representation to us all. of a psychedelic. Yes. Yeah. Something, something trying to stop me saying that particular uh, point. But it is, it is a really important point. By their libido, shall you know them? Because it gives an immediate framework, either with working clinically to get us straight away a read on somebody, or in personal development, anyone can do that for themselves in an objective fashion. If you just ask the simple question, what is it that's influencing, say, myself, you know, whoever, whoever it is in question, where is the libido going? And I've heard you guys say before as well that that essentially offers a window deep down into the person's psyche. It leads somebody to complexes, but also allows a way in. So there's not block, there's not resistance. And that, that can take the form of lots of different things, um, including pieces of uh, creativity in the world and media and stuff like that, that somebody is interested in. And the curiosity point that you mentioned is definitely, it's definitely true in lots and lots and lots of different ways. The, the curiosity leads somebody, my, my, something is interfering in, in my, in my head. <laughs> It's there, it then just gets removed straight away. Curiosity, that was a really important point. Completely gone. Just been removed. You know what you're saying about curiosity, but um, mm. I would bundle that, and you know that, that we do this. We, we would kind of formalise that into a forensic mindset. So curiosity is almost like the seeking system in its pure form. That's how it's, it's experienced. You feel that, literally feel it as an affect-charged uh, uh, signal of being in a state where you want to understand something. And uh, that, that's fairly common with a lot of therapists when they're operating at a relatively low level, um, and that's as far as it goes, and then they start to talk about empathy and things like that. The more skilled therapists, particularly of the old school, I'm going, when I say old school, I mean 19th century, would be more interested in rapport, because rapport is an interactive thing which emphasises the direction that the energy is going in as we would understand it these days as being part of the field whereas empathy tends to slip into i am enjoying this experience subjectively mm. of being able to model the other person even if i'm not really mm. doing it mm. it's something i believe i'm doing it and i feel good about that that's the trap of empathy mm. uh, but rapport leads you to a forensic mindset that serves curiosity, where the curiosity came from in its original form. And what you're doing then is moving from the instinct, the instinctive drive to understand into a cognitive position, which is downstream of that, which is the forensic mindset. 
and you hold both of them simultaneously so one does not override the other. I'm curious instinctively, but I am cognitively forensic. And then in between that, rapport operates at the level of affect for the other without collapsing into an empathy trap, which basically means you just pulled into yourself and away from the other. You may want to signal empathy, which is virtue signaling, mm -hmm. empathic virtue signaling, but you're not necessarily getting to the problem or to the core of the problem. And of course, we have to understand, and this is something that, you know, we, we need to do this with ourselves for personal development, certainly as a, a clinical professional, the complexes are very, very capable of reading us and our intentionality uh, and utilizing everything that that person, that other person has uh, within their nature, uh, their intelligence, as Pauline mentioned before, their intuition, insofar as they have it, their sensory capacities to make a model of us and then to direct that person, literally direct that other person to frustrate a healthy outcome. And so if the therapist is getting off on empathy, they're, they've already lost. They have. Yeah. Well, if they've already lost, there's no hope for the person that they're working yeah. with, is there? Yeah. Uh, and, unless something in them switches on to what's happening uh, and actually sees another layer of deception in terms of um, what they've let themselves in for, if that happens, then potentially there could actually be a better outcome. Yeah. But just, um, just coming back to what you were saying about um, drive states as well, Stephen, and, and the forensic approach, the... The good thing about that, whether you know you're using utilizing that yourself as a therapist, or you're encouraging it in the person that you're working with, or it's somebody on their own, um, you know, applying a forensic approach to themselves as part of their self development, is that it, it changes um, the perception for that person of what is actually going on, because obviously most people when they're very very badly complex. Mm -hmm feel anxious or yeah. they they suggest to themselves that that is what they're experiencing they're experiencing anxiety and we always reframe that as being really just part of a, a drive state anxiety is not an emotion it's part of a drive state it's hugely important though. it's hugely important yeah. and then the moment that you you i think you realize that you can then actually utilize the drive state positively yeah. rather than it being something that is set against you and just uh, you know um accruing ideas and unpleasant ones at that it suddenly you you can turn that into something that allows you to and for some people it's for the very first time they can say well actually you know I'm, i this is interesting this is something that i can maybe have a different perspective on i i, I don't have to just see it as being analogous with suffering anymore mm. because actually it isn't that it's something completely different that's going on here mm. and this is just the way that, yeah. um, you know, my instincts, my genome are, are signaling to me that something needs to, I need to respond to them. Mm. Uh, I need to understand that, the, you know, I'm not getting the message that so the signal is, is becoming so cool. stronger. And um, it, it's such a great way of moving people beyond this idea that they're an anxious person or a depressed person or, you know, any of those kind of or almost psychiatric yeah. labels, really. Yeah, I think that's hugely important. So um, if you encounter as um, if any person in a general sense encounters a therapist who then takes a CBT model, should we say, or even a purely behavioral one about what they describe as being anxiety, even though they kind of have a superficial understanding of it involving a drive state, the way that they lead people on from that to model themselves and that experience yeah. is a problem in and of itself. It Whereas what you've, you've just said, Pauline, is that we know that we know from clinical experience that when people understand that, that uh, anxiety is not an emotion at all. Mm -hmm. It's not a quality of feeling that we can register cognitively, if you like, as being an emotion, it's something completely different. Yeah. Then your way of dealing with that is itself different. Yeah. Uh, and it can be liberating very, very quickly um, to understand that, as you were saying, James, by the libido shall you know them, it's a form of libido which is trapped in a drive state. Mm. And 
that dry state might be, as you say, Paul, I think you, you, you mentioned anyway, yes. there's something you need to avoid or get away from. Well, they're, they're instinctive reactions, they not are. cognitive ones. Yeah. And a cognitive solution to an instinct will never work. You have to find out what the instinct's intentionality is within a wider picture. Once you have that, you can then feel fully integrated with yourself. And then the complexes that are formed in response to the maladaptive cognitive element within us, mm. they have no fuel. That's right. They can't yeah. receive that anxiety yeah. to keep them going. Yeah. Uh, and that's the first stage of breaking them down. Yeah. You take away the drive state. There is, there is literally, they, they're, they're no longer invested with libido. No, no. They, they, they have to go. Yeah. And they do. They do it indeed. And as we've often said, the solution to wrong thinking is not right thinking. It's right feeling. Mm. When people feel better, it's a better state to be in than thinking better. Thinking better is downstream of feeling better. Once we've felt better enough, we can afford the luxury of thinking better and not be disturbed by the fact we're trying to override through a collapsed cognitive mm -hmm. model, something which is not cognitive at all and is pushing from within. Mm -hmm. If, however, we feel better, that can only be because we are properly linked up and integrated, connected with our instincts and properly adapted to the world. Then we can, we can think better without that thinking simply collapsing under the next bit of pressure that comes along. I remember what was trying to come through on my point about curiosity. If someone's not curious, they're de facto stuck because the interpretive frameworks that we pick up from the world, wherever they happen to come from, even if it's from uh, even something like CPT, for example, as you were suggesting, Pauline, some people believe that they're anxious people. Mm. It's like a qualia of them or they're a, dep a depressed person. It's just a qualia of them. You're stuck at that point straight away. But curiosity reminds me of the Socratic spirit. You're continually asking why to a state of affairs, including everything within one's own ecology. So that's the by their libido, shall you know them point. It's not so much, you know, I'm an anxious person. So why would you even believe that in the first place? Where's that coming from? And it's following that libido down. I've seen that with myself, my own personal development, but also with working with other people. That is so useful. And it, it allows you to enter into a state where it feels to me almost phenomenologically like lots of implicit questions are asked and there's room for freedom. It actually feels like a little space is being made that it, um, uh, almost like it's a creative internal. I don't want to use the word. It's too Jungian, but alchemical feeling you're, you're, you're being given a sense of almost prima materia or raw materials. And you're being asked, what do you want to do with it? How are you going to square this? If what you currently believed up to this point it's just complexes what's left and that's not a state of loss that's a state of promise and, and, and moving forward i found that to be really difficult to, to do really difficult and if but also immensely rewarding to do as well but you have to be curious in order to do that if someone just applies labels or books or internet gurus or whatever else to themselves they're not really working with the true unconscious. They're just being paddled around by complexes. Yeah. So people have to be prepared to know, I suppose, that this can be genuinely difficult. It's not just a case of learning theory, as you guys have suggested. You know, you have to actually live it. And with each experience that you have, your own understanding updates. And what you guys have said before, which is so true, with each checkpoint that you make, you look back, and you go, oh my God, I've come such a long way. How did I ever believe those things I once believed about myself and the world? But also you look ahead and there's a hell of a long way to go as well. So that there was something about when you were talking about curiosity earlier in all of this context that uh, really hit me is so key. But that ties in with the forensic mindset. So what we've covered so far then is the phenomenology of the experience of relating within a field, internally or interpersonally. And... Those fields are where complexes operate. But if we don't have that basic understanding of relating and the field phenomenon of relating externally or internally, we will not know what we're up against. We will not be able to make any separation between the healthy us and these things that, that have uh, 
been acquired by us along our trajectory, the timeline of our life. So that's absolutely the first and most important step is to do that. That gives the ego a, a place to stand, a firm place to stand from which to take the next firm step. Uh, without that, then we're at the mercy of every kind of insinuation, as Jung would have put it, that might come from the unconscious, or as the old hypnotist would have understood, influence or suggestion from others externally, because we're as vulnerable to either of those um, as each of those, depending upon circumstances. And when, of course, the two of them are in synchrony, such as we have an existing complex that's being fed through the suggestion of third parties, that then just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we refer to it and identify with it continuously. It then becomes uh, an operating parameter for our life. If we contradict the complex, it will attack us, that kind of thing. So knowing what we're up against uh, is so important. How to do that, understand how to relate, separate yourself off, discriminate, have a firm place to stand, be very, very curious, and then start the journey. And it needn't be slow and it needn't be quick. It takes as long as it takes, which can be very brief if you do the right things. That's something that Jungians don't generally understand or want to appreciate. The, the time dimension is not important. It does not have to take years. Uh, we shouldn't rush because that, that's, that's a trap. But we will be paradoxically quicker by being slow enough to allow ourselves to be fast. This is a question I've wanted to ask you for quite a while, actually. Homeostasis seems to be overall, the overall psychobiological homeostasis seems to be felt by the ego, almost like is an instinct for, uh, for personal development or for getting better or for healing or any sort of word therein. So I suppose if someone feels that they want to change, that they want to move past their complexes, they are ready. And hence, there's no need, exactly as you're saying, to delay. But also, another thing you guys have said is you, you go quicker by going slower. Yeah. That is absolutely and utterly true. Sometimes an, an, an overamped seeking system uh, can, can certainly get in the way of that. Complexes will co-opt that instinct, just feed off of it because there's a hell of a lot of pressure and then get pulled this way and get pulled that way and all over the place. But the, que the question I really, really want to ask on this is, is there, is there an instinct to get better? Oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely. Mm -hmm. We've um, spent too much time as a culture in the West separating mind and body off from one another. And therefore, what is known and observable about our physiology is being self-regulating and it preferring to be self-regulated has been split off with the body from the mind. So the notion then that this, the psyche is self-regulating, I mean, Jung did point this out. He said it was a self-regulating system and he got that far with it. Uh, but the way that it does it is so intimately linked with the self-regulation of our physiology. That's the key. That's not to reduce it into physiology, although physiology with respect to how the metabolism of the brain, say, uh, works itself through and deeper than that, how gene expression works uh, and then how the psyche regulates itself through all sorts of mechanisms are so intimately connected that you cannot separate them. They are superposition states. The only thing that can separate it is a neurosis. That's when the system is working against itself and it's insisting through the neurotic psychology that we should be dissociated from our bodies um, and we should be dissociated from a, a real adaptation through relating into the world. So you get your biopsychosocial complex at that, at that point. The complex may be rooted in our psychology they may originate there, but then it's superposition and so it turns up in the body and in our psychosocial relationships. It's in all of those states simultaneously. That might make it seem an impossible task to solve. It is not. Uh, and this is where the insights from people like George Engel, uh, Rossi and others came in uh, to help us to formulate our own approach through clinical empiricism over several, several decades now about how to get that sorted and to do it relatively quickly. Um, but if people believe that their bodies are, have no innovation by the psyche, 
do not react to the environment and do not reciprocally then influence the psyche. They're automatically split. And that's pure Pierre Janet. That's what maintains the split, is the belief that we are contained by whatever complex may be operant within us and that we identify with. That's the problem. It's not the case at all. And that goes back to ego strength again. It does. One on basic. Yeah. What might that look like for somebody if they're first starting out? Would it be assessing and building up as much as they can their own ego strength? Yeah, you need that before you even look at something like a personal myth trajectory, because without that, um, you, you could accrue all sorts of facts that you can bring about from your understanding of your personal history of your life uh, uh, and so forth. But you won't have sufficient echo strengths to deal with it. Um, and that's why we say that it's important to ask the first question with the personal myth, for example, what can I not give up without giving up being me? And a lot of people think, what are the positives? And what they do then is leave behind the negatives, which are there anyway. But you've just voluntarily become unconscious of them. And they're the things you're really looking for. And then in between those two states, there is that third state, which is the things that I implicitly believe and accept about myself, which are actually harmful, but I misinterpret as being positive. And I still say to myself, I cannot give up that because I wouldn't recognize who I am. Once you can get to that third position, then you've become about as conscious as you possibly can be. And then it's what next? And the difficulty there is that the ego has to accept that it's not the totality of the psyche, as Jung, of course, understood and uh, was very, very clear about. Where do you go to update yourself? Where do you go? Where, where can you can, can the ego reach in to find the resources that have been prepared for it? Well, uh, our argument, I know you're familiar with this, and as a microbiologist, you, you'd agree with this, it's genetic. It's in our innate potential. How to access that and to get past complexes, that, that's important. Because the beliefs that we have about our capacity to reach into the genome and to release our potential will either facilitate or inhibit our progress. If we think that mind and body are separate or they're completely different languages or that uh, the genome has nothing to do with my subjective individual psychology, you're immediately setting up fuel for a complex to occupy that space and say, that's right, you can't do it. And then it's as if the complex is saying metaphorically, just listen to me and everything will be all right. I've evolved along your timeline to protect you against all these frustrations you've felt. I know what your limitations are. And if you try and get beyond yourself, I'll make you feel anxious or depressed or I'll generate OCD or whatever it might be. Uh, and then the person's in a loop. It's loop cognition and they are attached to their understanding of themselves without having access to that which can can blow away the complexes and release their potential into the world so that in other words the model that we have will itself feed into complexes so we we, we have to be really really precise we have to get metaphorically something like this out and start to look away outside of the ego deep into ourselves uh, and also into the wider world and into other areas of knowledge beyond psychology human evolution, paleoanthropology, history, that kind of thing. Biology, of course, evolutionary biology. Uh, and, and look at how we've evolved, because as Jung did point out, that the psyche is an evolutionary phenomenon. And the solution to just about every adaptive problem that we can encounter has been uh, learned, acquired in the past, and is represented within the genome as information that is capable of being released into consciousness. Some of that's on timed release and we can't get too far ahead of ourselves, uh, but other parts are available for updating if we approach in the right way. That initial personal myth question then, you know, when one looks inside, what can they not give up without giving up them? The further along in the journey someone goes, the more they'd come to realize that really that needs to become a non-ego question, that the thing you can never let go of is the genomic intent. How, what the ego does with that is the job of the ego to do. 
So it's not saying there's no point in having an ego. It's all just a sense of destiny in that sense. But that's obviously the most fundamentals. Our, our meta instinctive canonical um, structure to the lifespan and also the character of a person where someone is best placed, their positive qualities that and have not been brought forward from the so-called unconscious. They still remain relatively undeveloped because of adaptive pressure. So what I am noticing, and this 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 is, this speaks to the point of uh, lived experience rather than just looking at theory, is over the course of this conversation, I feel progressively more and more like something is interfering or attempting to interfere, not with the words I'm saying, but before they come out of my mouth. Uh, you know, like um, a decrease in bandwidth of the Miller number for people who've seen the earlier part of this video. It's very real. I don't know why it's there trying to stop me saying certain things, which is exactly what complexes would do. Well, you you were saying before you you actually got into that state that to some extent you have to go back beyond the personal myth sometimes, presumably into um, the ancestral psyche, for example, to override complexes. Sometimes that's the only way is to go deeper in and maybe whatever it was that was trying to interfere with what you were trying trying to say was pulling you away from being too cognitive but it's difficult when when you're engaged in something like this which is essentially a dialectic where you to some extent you have to be cognitive because you're having to express ideas uh it is mm -hmm. is going to want to keep you here but another part of you is taking you away uh, and encouraging you to dissociate in order to experience something else that's probably deeper and more meaningful yeah. and uh, you know I, I you do when I say you do this all the time James what I mean by that is is that you engage I don't mean you do it all the time as in you dissociate all the time I mean you you're up for this you engage with the process this is one of your great strengths is that you're prepared to put yourself on the line and you you've always been like that since we've known you and, and this is how it is for all of us. So in, in a way, as much as it's uncomfortable for you to have to experience that, in nonetheless, it's a real time example of how these things happen to us all. Mm. And no, no doubt you will go away and you'll process this and something, something of meaning will come through. Maybe when we finished here, it may not happen right now. It may be something that's brewing literally in the background that's wanting your attention and, you, and you'll come back and you will attend to it because I know that that's what you do and you you engage with the process it's one of your great strengths thank you Pauline uh, it, it works really nicely as well as a better means of communicating than just cognition and that is a point I really wanted to raise with, with you guys and it is difficult to communicate in words but thinking is so annoying a lot of the time because it doesn't work to solve problems yes. someone can just think through a problem over and over and over again and even if they reach a coherent conclusion it doesn't necessarily mean anything because ideas are always abstract the power of uh, really the, the power literally to push through and um, break down complexes of affect and the lived connection to life and all the subtleties of affect too so i feel a lot of people feel because i certainly did that the affect is one one emotional state or another i'm happy or i'm sad it's not it's way more subtle than that mm. um a, a relational lived qualia and a, and a feeling of connectedness but it's not even really a feeling it's something more phenomenological than than that how to communicate that is really difficult but that's the answer it's something that will come out through relating to others so cooperation with a group in a paleolithic environment would would work through that it would work through instinct um it wouldn't be really that people got around and cogitated and decided what they were going to do they would move as a unit where they all understood the complete scenario at that point there's no complexes at all because complexes primarily are cognitive primarily they have that element um with modern humans when we're away from cognition and we can move by instinct, and I don't mean primitive Freudian, uh, degraded pathological uh, instinct, but natural instincts, then people relate through instincts and things like intuition that then takes on its original uh, importance of being perception by way of the unconscious, as Jung called it. Uh, and we would prefer to 
talk about perception of the field, the wider field of information, which includes the environment, the psychosocial relationships and the intrinsic internal relationship. All of those things superpositioned are represented and understood at an instinctive level, which is then confirmed by feeling right. Mm. And everybody moves and does and lives appropriately according to that within a group. You see this with social predators like wolves. Wolves are highly intuitive in many respects that they can separate from one another and perform a hunting task without sight, uh, sound or smell of one another. They all know what they have to do and they go and do it. The, the, the goal of uh, an attack on a prey animal is, is in mind. It's, it's a shared goal and they act towards that by instinct. They don't cogitate about it. Mm. And when humans work like that, then they relate well and adapt well to a paleolithic environment. But we've evolved this cognitive ego, which has some uses, but it's also the primary cause of neurosis. So attempting to fix the problem by overamping the problem, which is what cognitive therapy does and cognitive behavioral therapy does, and all of the derivations between those two is, in my view, stupid. That's completely the wrong way to do it. But you were, as you say, mm. attempting to translate into language mm. through Zoom, you know, through mm. video, um, an affect state which understood something. And that's when it falls away because cognition will always struggle to represent affect. It has to turn it into something else. Yes, it has to be lived. It has to be actual relating in in its biopsychosocial yeah. forms. Um, yeah, cognition is certainly the problem. Uh, always, for in varying degrees, depending from person to person, obvi obviously, but cognition will always make problems worse. Obviously, it can be good to help give an immediate sense of of ego strength. If if, yeah. if someone's if someone's watching their their thoughts disappear off into absolute nonsense, um, pulling that back can help ground somebody but the solution can never come from that because mm -hmm. instincts don't reach up and uh, innovate the ego via cognition it's just one of the insights from neuropsychoanalysis isn't it that the affect is always before cognition so behind every thought is an emotion and i think that's one of the things i was trying to mention earlier is that kind of self-concept auditing with a sense of curiosity everything within one's ecology why is it here and they'll all lead back via not thinking, but affect threads down to the, the realm of the meta instincts. I've certainly seen that lots of times with working with other people and in myself too, but it, it can't be cognitive. It runs out. Or as you guys have said, it, it, it seems to just loop on itself. Yeah. Loop cognition. Mm. Yeah. It's um, if you like a corrupted uh, attempt at self cure loop cognition. However, um, the modern human being, will start with cognition and will end with cognition, but they are different states of cognition. So the state of cognition that is aware that they're in a mess is cognition that has failed to understand the situation of adaptation uh, that they are in and the requirements to change. The final level of cognition is, is when affect and instinct and adaptation have been fully integrated. Then you can generate a cognitive model about the experiences that you've been through. So you make a representation of that. And that's a direct analog with clinical work, if you're a therapist, that um, the final end stage of cognition is the theory. But you've gone through all of the other things in order to arrive at that. Whereas if you start with the cognition, you're starting with something which does not understand. It's an abstraction, uh, the task of relating. And that analog is reversible. So you can say about yourself, if I start with a cognitive model, say it's Jungian or whatever it is, then everything will be filtered through that. And it's all internal projection and you are not really relating to yourself at all. That's great for complexes because they will absorb that theory and use it back at you. You have the shadow. You have the negative anima. The dark side of the self is going to destroy you. The next thing you know, you're into a corrupted version of Nietzsche or a corrupted version of Russian fictional writers, however 
great they may have been in their personal achievement because of what you may internally um, you know, take on board from some internet guru or celebrity psychologist. This then forms the nucleus of a complex within your self-concept that influences the ego that then interprets the attempt to correct for that from within at an affect or drive state level as being something which confirms the internalized suggestion from the celebrity psychologist or whoever. And then the complex just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the person is trapped in an awful state of unremitting angst and uh, bad cognition, bad understanding. The worst state somebody's in or the more neurotic the ego is, the more likely they are to pick up more and more and more complexes from the outside world under, it seems a healthy intent like the, the the instinctive pressure that should really be used for relating and living out potential is capped by complexes. New ones are generated, and then people do have all kinds of really strange ideas and strange marriages of ideas as well. So yeah. recently, more and more people uh, with this, a, a strange version of Christianity, a strange version of pop psychology, and a strange version of alchemical Jung all sort of mesh together. And when someone's got an instinctive issue that they're unconscious of, or at least the etiology the, the, the set up instructions of the complex they're unconscious of the last thing they need is some kind of abstract religious not religious religious yeah. mess like that or for a, a young man who who um i've seen this so many times it's like one of the the pertinent issues of this generation the young man who has issues around self-esteem uh relating to women the status standard instinctive stuff that everyone has to come to terms with in themselves um, and then they come across a whole bunch of men older men online telling them this is how women are in a very particular way this is what men should be um, this is what you should do in terms of your work in terms of your responsibilities etc 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 et, cetera, et, cetera, et cetera. Um, and it just takes what might have been a natural masculine protest amps it up to a million and the person then suddenly gets very anxious very depressed mm. this happens so often yeah so it's that auditing process that seems so crucial with going right back to the start of this dialectic that sense of lived experience yeah. being so important any theory that someone has picked up needs to be pressure tested that's of course where dialectical syncretism that's the fourth pillar of psychosystems analysis comes in which is something we could talk about yeah. but People really do, if they're in a state like that, um, and which they will feel, they will feel, they will know if they have complexes or not that are actively bothering them. It's not something that needs to be cognitivized. Um, they do need to be honest about what has influenced them and be prepared to scrape all of that away, which, which can be difficult, can require courage, a hell of a lot of courage to do, but is necessary for any real growth to take place. We've evolved to be influenceable that's part of the problem. Uh, if we go back to the, the wolf analogy, you know, um, there is a hierarchy, obviously, within a wolf pack that works, uh, and it's to the benefit of everyone. And if you go back to a, a similar model, if you like, of a, a paleo hominid uh, group, then they are going to have to be able to trust one another in the same way, and also to, to learn through the influence of others about how we should approach and tackle things. We wind that forward into the modern world and how the brain has evolved and the, the ego and our personal psychologies have evolved. We are still vulnerable to influence and suggestion from what someone like Caesar Milan would call a poor pack leader. And he would say, dogs do not follow poor leaders, humans do. Yeah. Uh, and that's entirely true, unfortunately. We, we internalize from a lot of these internet guru types all sorts of nonsense, which is basically just their own maladaptations and the limitations of their personality because of an instinct to follow leaders, to follow wise leaders, to follow appropriate leaders. And there aren't many of them around externally. So one of the best ways to check against that is to go into the, the Paleolithic psyche, which we still carry within us. And that's probably best discussed in another video where we could really go into some depth about yeah. the ancestral psyche and how that works through. But the way that these influences negatively from internet gurus and the like um, take root is through that instinct for collaboration and to follow leaders. So the complexes readily form around that. 
and as you said paul very yeah. often that the more intelligent people are in that ordinary sense of intelligence yeah. Yeah. then the more suggestible they are yeah well they are because they're, they're, they're generally more open to ideas and, and mm. to working with ideas and it's easy isn't it when maybe we see leaders who are very obviously that way I mean, i'm thinking of some of the political leaders that we have on the world stage at the moment it's not difficult to see what they are but it's 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 harder when it's it's more subtle or it, it's somebody who appears to be benevolent in some way or they they have a kind of a you know an admixture of both that you know they might have that side to them that is um you know, uh, Adler in the sense that they're striving uh, or, or, mm. or being driven by their own power drive, but they may also have something about them that appears to want to help other people. And that, mm. that combination yeah. is a little bit more difficult to deal with than, say, somebody yeah. who was obviously outrightly yeah. and obviously evil and doesn't hide the fact yeah. that, say, they're that way. Yeah. So it, it's always it's always the nuance, isn't it? It's always yeah. the, the the gray areas which are a little bit more yeah. difficult to deal with for people, and therefore, yeah. whoever those people are, the more likely um, to be able to apply some influence, yeah, um, and not necessarily always positively either. Yeah, That's a great point. And of course, complexes are always adaptive. That's what they're for. We evolved in a large cerebral cortex particularly the frontal mm. lobes of, of frontal areas of both lobes mm. you know because the brain works as an integrated unit the, the cerebral cortices sit upon older deep um subcortical structures which fundamentally determine everything this is an insight from neuropsychoanalysis and affective neuroscience um so to think in terms of specificity for a cerebral cortex in and of itself can become a complex through influence and suggestion and people start to divide themselves between what they imagine is one hemisphere or the other, you know, mm -hmm. and to get those kinds of effects, you normally have to damage the brain permanently or temporarily to see how a broken brain works rather than an integrated brain and an integrated mind. Um, I know we've uh, we've had graphics on on this earlier, so that that's going to be an important thing. The Large Hadron Collider, for example, uh, and that's important clinically. But the main point, I think, for me at this point is, is to to understand the importance of influence and suggestion from others and why we are vulnerable to that. And then when we get down into the nitty gritty of it, complexes are very much interested in as you've pointed out, the conditions under which they formed, James, when you mentioned that just a, a few moments ago. Um, in that sense, complexes want to preserve the past in the future through the present. And then we come to a paradox, the instincts and the, 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 the fields associated with the genome, which represent the ancestral psyche, all formed in the past too, but they are interested in the future and in adaptation in the future. And complexes appear to be similar, but they're not. They are always regressive, retrogressive, but instincts which you would think are regressive are not, they are progressive. They want us to move through our lifespan developments and adapt properly, which is why instincts are quite diffuse. And it's why they are represented by what we call meta instincts, which Jung interpreted as being archetypes. That is to say, whole situations and whole scenarios, not something collapsed into little reified figures, but a context that has meaning in and through the lifespan. Uh, now, that provides for a great deal of, uh, of bandwidth, uh, but complexes are collapsed states that resolve out of meta-instinctive scenarios as maladaptations to them. Uh, and once they're set up, and again, in the earlier part of the video, James, you provided the graphics of Pierre Janet and his model of dissociation. Once they're set up, they then can cap instinct and innovate uh, the ego and its self-concept and completely mess up our adaptation to the world and to reality. Uh, and there's all sorts of ways that they can do that, which we could go into. I think we should. <laughs> the, the first clinically and you can do this through introspection the first way that, that, that you can detect the complex is the way that they seamlessly innovate a person's thoughts and speech through relating externally 
or internally when we have an internal dialogue or an idea uh, or a situation or an anticipation appears to represent itself to us from within. Much of it will appear to be quite reasonable and rational and logical. That, that will appeal to the ego, but embedded within that will be something quite unpleasant. And because it's embedded, we won't detect it, but its intentionality is to get the ego to agree with the whole scenario that's presented by the, by the complex. So it's as if the first thing it says is quite reasonable and then we accept it. So it's pacing us and then it leads us into confirming it. It's a pacing and leading from complexes internally. We, we accept it. We, yeah, that's true. That, that is true about me. That happened and I did that and whatever it might be. And then they add something to that, which you believe because you believe the rest of it. And it's that which is the key to understanding that this is a destructive complex, which is, which is occupying uh, a part of our psyche, is capping our instinct, instincts and misdirecting our libido. You pick that up in conversation if you're a therapist, um, because inevitably they show themselves. They, they, they can't resist doing it. And they seek confirmation every bit as much as the normal ego personality seeks psychosocial confirmation. We all want to have that. We want to be acknowledged as being real, as being rational, as having value. Complexes do the same thing. And what they will do is co-opt a therapist to confirm the complex by embedding uh, speech, if you like, or words within a sentence, within a phrase, which itself is embedded within a wider context that the therapist starts to nod and agree to. And then the complex picks that up and says, agree with this. It's embedded in, in what this person says, and the, yeah, and the complex will then insinuate internally, see, I told you. And it's not what the therapist said. It's the fact that the therapist has been co-opted to confirm the complex. And the ego does not discriminate itself from the complex that identifies with it. So that feeling of being confirmed then is the feeling of the complex being confirmed and then the person remains stuck or they go away worse than when they came in because it's been confirmed. And if, if you work properly with someone, you can reach the point where you can actually point this out to them in real time. Uh, and if your conversation is being recorded, then they, you can ask them to play it back and they can hear themselves doing it in that moment. This other thing presented itself. It inserts itself in the conversation, it co-ops the therapist to confirm it, and then that's it, they're stuck, and they remain stuck. And it becomes a habit then. And if you're in a lengthy analytical process, one of the reasons it takes so long for classical analysis is the repeated confirmation of complexes by analysts. And when the analyst talks about mythopoetic things and uh, brings in the Greek gods or the Norse gods or whoever gods it might be, um into the uh dis the discussion and, and says see it's just like that and you are like that you, this is the hero's journey and the complex is, is sitting there analyzing responding feeling inserting confirming and the person goes away and thinks they're doomed or they're stuck or they're inadequate or they get inflated which of course suits the complex because the ego cannot maintain that inflation without bursting and then collapsing into depression and then the analyst interprets that as that's the transference reaction or it's resistance. And it goes on and on and on like that forever because they lack the basic skills of catching the complexes in real time. They don't understand their dynamics and how they set up, how they originally started. And much of this is because when Jung separated himself from the influence of Pierre Janet, then his students downstream of him, many generations down, just do the same thing. They don't understand Pierre Janet. They do not understand trans states. They do not understand hypnosis, that kind of thing. Whereas I think it's fair to say, mm. Paul, isn't it? In our experience, mm. uh, hypnosis and altered states of consciousness are the ideal way of accessing complexes because you draw them out yeah. by reducing the, mm. the, the tension, as uh, Janet would have understood it, of the ego, the background dynamics emerge right out and you see them clearly. 
So that's what you need to do. If, if you can uh, bring about by whatever means an altered state of consciousness in the relationship that you have, the therapeutic relationship, and complexes immediately show themselves. And at that point, you get the pure dissociation. And you can literally communicate directly with the complex then as separated from the ego. You've, you've separated it. Mm. And the ego can experience that is not me. Mm. And the power of that is something that is so beyond Jungians who cack handedly maintain that division and confirm it in people repeatedly for years and years and years. Yeah. Well, yes, and just as you were speaking, see, I was thinking how how people do get locked in to therapy for, for such a, a long period of time. Yeah. And, you know, it can, we've known people to be in therapy for like 13 years. Yeah. It's like, my God, that's such a big chunk of your life that yeah. you should be out there living. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's, um, it's scandalous that that should happen. The yeah. other thing that it brought to mind and uh, I'm probably paraphrasing here, really, um, but it was um, it was a point in uh, the book Freud's Women. Oh yeah. To do with Emma Freud, and apparently she was having um, obviously what were uh, psychosomatic symptoms, and part of them I, I, I think were related to her digestion in some way, and she had a female physician who offered to operate on her uh, to uh, you know remove whatever the yeah. physical cause was of what was essentially neurosis yeah. and the surgery went ahead and apparently this female uh, physician said that she'd remove some pus from uh, this from, from Emma's digestive tract and Freud was a, a, apparently afterwards, after she recovered a bit, apparently she improved initially, and then that improvement fell away, and she remained basically a partial invalid for the for the rest of oh. her days. But Freud's response to that was, uh, he kind of lamented the fact that that intervention had taken place, and he said something along the lines of, oh no, now she'll never be well. Yeah. and unfortunately he was right mm. and of course that was because the the, the real issues hadn't been properly mm. addressed and it, the expectation had been built up uh, in Emma's mind that that would be the solution to that problem and uh, the underlying psychodynamics were never yeah. you know, fully resolved but that came to mind as you were speaking about how people if, if they have the wrong therapist the wrong kind of therapist someone who hasn't worked sufficiently on themselves doesn't have a sufficient understanding of complexes could easily just lock somebody into years and years and years of suffering from which they may not emerge yeah and so who you work with is incredibly important yeah. and i think if you have any kind of instinctive doubt about what you're doing or what you're experiencing what you're going through you should put an end to it yeah. because in a way arguably that that in and of itself is ego strengthening it is, to be yeah, able to yeah. take a stand against something which is essentially toxic and harmful to you and of course it can happen mm. in therapy that you're just simply with the wrong person that person is just keeping the problem going for you then that's something that you should do and start again or maybe think about going the you know the self-development route mm with sufficient uh, understanding of what you need to do is entirely possible yeah and it is probably um preferable to be honest with you if yeah. you can do it for yourself it, it has yeah. to be better so just as you were you know mm. you were talking um obviously you're talking about the positive side to what can be done to help people to discriminate themselves out and away from complexes mm. and that's the beginning of their healing really mm. but you know, awful to say it, but there's probably not that many people out there thinking in that way. No, no, there aren't. And um, I guess that's a bit of a warning, really, is to be to be careful. Yeah. About who you work with. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, complexes are the absolute stuff of psychotherapy. They are. They should be. They, yes, they that, should that be. was my next point. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, mm. but they are not, mm. um, because people don't understand the relationship between mm. mind, body, environments yeah. in the right way. Yeah, that's um, true. And it's a right mess out there. All of the psychoreductive therapies need to be 
cancelled. I hate to use that term, but effectively yeah. they do. Um, because there is no psychology without biology and there's no, neither of those two without the environment either. Yeah. All three of them are intimately linked mm. and energy and information mm. superposition between all of them. Uh, and any training that does not understand that properly scientifically mm. um, is, is inadequate training. Mm. So any kind of it cognitive is. reductionism should be out. Yeah. Um, the old traditional analytical, classical analytical mm. roots are a complete failure. Uh, they're almost extinct in, mm. in frontline healthcare for very good reason, because they cannot deal with simple things no. uh, and they can't deal with complicated things either. Yeah. They can only deal with artifacts that they generate through their theory mm. and through suggestion. Mm. You know, as we used to joke, you know, and say, well, if you go to a Freudian, he'll give you, he'll persuade you you've got a Freudian problem yeah. and then give you a Freudian solution right. and suggestion is the way out. Yeah. It'll just take years and years and years. Yeah. And it's the same with a Jungian. You go to a Jungian with the same problem, but you allow yourself to be influenced. You'll generate an internal model through suggestion of what the problem is. Mm. He'll, he or she will then offer you mm. uh, a Freudian solution, mm. a Jungian solution. And if you go along with it, it will take as long as the theory says it will take. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and it's pretty much the same with all of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, it, it needs a complete reboot. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we often, and this, this is part of our lament, we yeah. often wish that, that Jung had carried on with, yeah. and obviously uh, built on uh, Jeanne's work yeah. and, and developed this theory of complexes more than he did. I mean, it's a, such a great shame. I think we often say, don't we, that the whole edifice yeah. of psychotherapy would have been different had that happened historically, yeah, had he continued with it. And, uh, yeah. 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 But we know, obviously, it's, yeah. it's gone in a particular direction. And, and, and it has no, certainly, this has been our experience, no real frontline applicability whatsoever. No. no. You have to go back to the fundamentals. All of Jung's practical work was done in the from 1900, anyway, should we say, yeah. to about 1910, yeah. roughly, at the outside. Uh, those 10 years were his most productive, mm -hmm. uh, and that was because he was working under the influence of other people, yes. like Pierre Jeanne, yes. uh, Eugen Bloiler. He was yes. working with people like Franz Recklin, yeah. uh, and that was generating mm. real solutions to real problems yeah. and immense mm. potential was there. So had he, if he, if he had to separate from Freud, had he separated from yeah. him and collaborated with Pierre Jeanne, we would have a very different mm. uh, approach now to psychotherapy. Yeah. And the, uh, the abhorrence that is CBT would never have evolved. No. It would never have had to evolve no. to fill the vacuum mm. generated by the analytical reductive models of the day mm. but of course it probably couldn't have happened because Jung did not collaborate well with anyone uh, Freud didn't um mm. Jeanne was more of a more of a collaborator mm. um so it would have it would have been down to Jung to make that effort and he mm. never did mm. he never collaborated with anybody mm. very well at all yeah I mean obviously he spent time in the Berkholsley and, and he had direct contact with mm. you know the patients within the Berkholsley and we've often we've often spoken about uh Bloiler as well uh, with, with his direct yeah. involvement you yeah. know he would eat and, and and uh you know not literally sleep but he, he yeah. would he would share he would give of, his, of himself to that extent he was in yeah. to use a young in expression in the soup with those people and and that's where we know, lived in with his he wife lived in with his wife yeah and i just yeah. i think that's exemplary yeah actually they, they cooked for the patients yeah he gardened with the patients yeah. he he did physical yeah. creative work yeah. with OT patients. type or occupational therapy type yeah work. yeah, he, yeah he did all of that he did. Yeah. yeah yes uh young has went his own way and, yeah uh, yeah that's history yeah mm. but uh what we still call complexes are the very stuff of, of, of psychotherapy, they are. without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. Mm. And uh, understanding dissociation is fundamental to that, mm. and therefore understanding hypnosis. But hypnosis is not one thing. It's like psychotherapy, so many different schools, there are so many different approaches to hypnosis. So we can't collapse this into being one thing. Mm. Um, in our view, the best... Uh, lineage in that would come once we take all of the old the, the really old early hypnotists and, and hypnotherapists into account through Jeanne uh, and then 
a big leap forward into Milton Erickson to some extent and then into Ernest Rossi. That's the right route to take. Um, very, very powerful, very, very effective. Uh, but of course, we can extend uh, hypnotic trance states into the use of things like creative therapies, all of the different kinds of creative therapies, um, and how you can work with complexes through all of those as well, because they are all altered states of consciousness. I've got an example to share from someone I was working with fairly recently to show how sneaky complexes are, really, mm. and really how real they are, too. As you guys have been saying, the real stuff of psychotherapy. The person I was working with fairly recently basically said uh, a lot of complex rhetoric, essentially along the lines of the pacing and leading that you guys were mentioning a moment ago. I've never had any friends which is not quite true, but more or less they've, they've, their, their past history has shown that they're not the best or have not historically been the best with relating, but that's okay. Um, therefore, no one likes me and I will never have friends and I am doomed. So it was the pacing and leading process. Um, and I did call the complex out. I, I, I told them that is a complex and you should not be identifying with this complex. And then they said, and this was fascinating. They said, actually, you know what? I had a dream last night I want to tell you the dream spontaneously. And the dream was they were handed a letter from someone who they didn't know. They weren't so they didn't know who had sent that particular letter that had on it everything that person had just said to me. And in the dream, they handed me the letter. And I thought that was so stark that they were handed the letter in the dream to hand to me. And in real life, they'd woken up, forgotten the dream and handed me the letter metaphorically. The complex had already revealed itself, it seems, or the dynamics ahead of time within the dream. Um, and then I thought the polite thing to do, I suppose, was to ask, well, who sent the letter? So to ask the unconscious mind of the person who sent the letter. They had a dream, I think, a couple of days later that revealed who sent the letter, uh, with a further collaboration being uh, shown between themselves and me, moving away from this particularly toxic person to move on and uh, presumably work on solving the problem. That's still an active thing in process, but it was so stark when I saw that they just read the letter out straight away and passively believed it. So the disidentification process is so important. And that's obviously not what you, just, you don't get that with CBT. You don't get that with classical analysis. Whatever someone says, they have a reason to believe that it is true. And the more cognitive someone is, the more likely they are to actually, yeah, maybe that is true. You know, because that there are, I can think of at least one very prominent internet psychologist who would take what that person said. You know, I've never been, I've never had friends, therefore I never will. It's like, well, actually, maybe that is, maybe that is true. Maybe you are terrible. Maybe you have a, a an, an awful chaotic existence, and you need to come to terms with the evilness inside of you and the destructiveness inside of you. It's the wrong thing to yeah. say to somebody. Yeah, the wrong thing. Yeah. Well, that, that was great. You know, obviously what you did there was was exactly the right thing. And that was confirmed by the fact that they uh, that progressed further on and information was further released and revealed to you. And that, that's part of relating, isn't it? You, so you, you related properly. You recognised the fact that you were being offered something from outside of his ego. So he didn't even really know he was doing it. Oh, the ego didn't know, uh, but the preparation had been made and had been revealed in the dream. Then you responded to that and then the confirmation came back and you were able to move on with him. Um, but that's that kind of uh, engagement that is necessary to help people. I think what you've illustrated there too, James, is two potentially different outcomes depending on, you know, had that... Uh, person seeing the other person that you were describing uh, that could have been well it would have been a very different process and therefore a very different outcome mm. to you know th this particular person having worked with yourself so it, you know it, it is important who you open up to it, it really really is and and it's uh it's worth it's worth doing your homework if you're thinking of embarking on therapy in, in some way shape or form or just, you know, bearing in mind that um, if you're going to do it through, say, the, the internet and you're going to open yourself up to uh, internet gurus, then that might be the kind of thing that comes back at you. Um, and to just 
you know you have to be prepared for that degree of influence coming back at you yeah so you know who we choose to allow to influence us is, is really really important yeah and we do have a choice we do you have to own up to that don't you first yes. and yes. Uh, take responsibility but not in a harsh way but in a natural way mm. you know if somebody's aggressive and cognitive and uh accusatory and, and says you have this response but you must do this you must do that yeah. that's every wrong signal you could possibly give out to someone yeah um as you know james the way that we work is that we seek first with someone uh in terms of building up the rapport to access that part of them that is interested in their health and in optimizing themselves along their lifespan mm. and this is not the ego usually because the ego has usually been innovated by complexes which we, you know, we all accrue uh, along our timeline uh, as, as natural enough maladaptations to life, but there is a, a deeper part that's interested in health. Mm. And if you can communicate with that directly and a person experiences that safe healing dissociation within them that is not a complex, that is bigger than them, that is relaxed and is anticipatory, about a positive future that is such a powerful experience it is transpersonal it's the thing that the Jungians talk about with this reification of theirs of the self archetype mm. as if that takes 100 years to get there you can do it in 10 minutes mm. if you do the right things because it really is there not in the way that they reify it though because that's all concealed you know uh, or it, it, it conceals the deeper healing parts of a person yeah. with layer upon layer of absolute nonsense yeah and reification that's why it takes so long for them yeah. to get almost nowhere yeah so really you have to ask yourself the question what why why is it concealed in that way well the answer is pretty obvious really isn't mm. it because it means that the analysis is going to take time uh, and it might never conclude yeah um and therefore you're you know you're you're shackled to that for, for yeah. however long yeah uh, so you know, there are advantages built in to the concealment, not necessarily that, that benefit the patient or the no. analyst, but certainly yeah. benefit the analyst. Yeah. And, and you have, I think you have to, you have to be that, dis well, back to discrimination again, isn't it? Yeah. But also not necessarily just uh, at a cognitive level, but you, but you have to bring, you have to harness your instincts you and do. you have to say, yeah. you have to feel yeah. your way into it. Just this feel like it's this you know yeah is this instinctively right what i'm entering into now and i think if you get any sense that it's not that you should you should back away mm -hmm. and it may be the first time that you've actually engaged your instincts properly which yeah. is no bad thing no. um but then once you once you've done that you realize the importance of, of making assessments about situations in that way yeah and uh, that's very ego strengthening as well yeah i totally agree with that and of course um it's very rare for anybody to experience that um, without being helped in some way. Yeah. And that's the responsibility of the therapist, mm -hmm. in my view, is, is to help a person experience the non-subjective self, but mm -hmm. the transpersonal self within them. Uh, not as an idea, but as an experience. Yeah. Anybody could offer it as a theory and say that you have this self archetype and you must draw mandalas mm -hmm. forever. You know, or a, a sort of nonsense that these youngins uh, preoccupy themselves with. But if in the very moment they can experience a transcendental, transpersonal experience of their deeper, unifying, organismic self, mm. um, and all you've done is to facilitate that and for that other part of them to communicate directly with that, that subject, that person's ego, and say, yes, I agree, and I agree with the therapist that it, this is right and this will work. Let's go for this. That is so powerful. I never once heard a Jungian ever say that they can do that or even knew that it was possible. But any competent, and I mean this in the fullest sense, any competent depth psychotherapist will know not only is that possible but you could do that within a few minutes of meeting someone if you know what to do and if you respect the the process properly uh, but it is so rare because so few people are trained in that kind of thing these days mm. and they're certainly not experienced enough in it
What follows now is a narration of 16 posts by Steve Richards from our Young to Live By Discord server, all on the nuances of working with complexes clinically and for personal development. All were prompted by questions from dedicated students and inquirers into depth psychology, who are working valiantly on themselves and to understand the psyche in its lived reality. If you'd like to join the server, there's a link in the description. Steve has written thousands of posts, all of which are instantly available. Let us begin. On working with personal memories. A student reports that they've understood the very first complex on their timeline, pertaining to their self-perception of incompetence. They isolated certain memories and linked them to present complex activity. The student asks Steve if their complex is indeed capable of this, constellating past memories in order to generate the ego's feeling of incompetence. Steve replies, The first place to start is to be inquisitive about the phenomenon of you and the biopsychosocial domain you flourish within. That is the domain of your complexes too. Complexes form under many conditions and can be as simple as habits of learning or as destructive as the systematized fragmentation of schizophrenia. In the main, they are relatively autonomous subsystems, Piaget, that formed in response to experience that either occurred or, paradoxically, did not occur. The former are easy to grasp as they include many kinds of negative experience, including what we commonly refer to as trauma of whatever kind. The latter, however, fall under the remit of what Anthony Stevens calls frustration of archetypal intent, and which we refer to as frustration or misfiring of meta-instinctive intent. Functionally, in the context of Anthony's work, we mean the same thing, because unlike mainstream Jungians, he has a grounded understanding of biology and evolution. In the context you mention, in your final paragraph, it's best to think of this as an instinctive task that has significance for your sense of competence and status. That sounds as if it's a big issue, but the remedy is simple. The frustration is likely to be of your seeking system paired with your play system, both in neuropsychoanalytic terms. Seeking relates in a primordial sense to utility to a group and utility to a group is about status. So it's likely that the frustration has become a symbol of frustrated status and potential. In other words, the frustration of your instincts for achievement of your potential and recognition of attainment by others has collapsed into a basic representation of itself, a symbol. This happens when the frustration originates not in the ego, but in the unconscious. We get shown an image of ourselves, as falling short of our potential, in effort to make us so fed up with the unpleasant affect it generates that we adjust our drive state accordingly and optimise. Complexes form under such conditions, as dissociated subroutines, to intercept the unpleasant affect and representations, which are paradoxically encouraging us to change, and cap their pressure or divert it into something else. The psyche reacts by ramping up the signal, and the complex counter-reacts by strengthening its cap and displacement. If the ego can learn to receive the signal without anxiety about it, the signal will fade, and when we adjust accordingly, it will disappear altogether. In the interim, we can expect the complex to resist, as it was set up under conditions wherein the ego generated it to defend itself from instinctive pressure. That's when we need to bypass the complex and go straight to the homeostatic principle, which will adjust to the ego's new position about itself, and break the complex down into free energy. On complexes capping instinct. A student asks, what if there were no complexes to cap instinctive pressure? 
Would there be walking zombies everywhere from overblown, unregulated affect? Also, how does one practically bypass a complex and go straight to the homeostatic principle? Do you have an example of some sorts? Steve replies, The first thing to do is examine your major premise. No complexes to cap instinctive pressure does not mean no complexes, just no Genean partitioning to intercept instinctive pressure and redirect it. Instinctive pressure, if it needs capping homeostatically, needs to be used up by action in the world or by displacement into fantasy. Pansepian instincts without a context to express them fire randomly. At a minimum, this produces a drive state that cannot be sustained, mania. So adaptive mechanisms must be deployed, including complexes. No complexes, no adaptive action, no holding space fantasy, which feeds complexes under all normal conditions, will mean that stability is fundamentally compromised and the ego fragments into complexes, as in schizophrenia, Jung. So the major premise needs revision. As for examples, I've discussed this many times in Jung to Live By videos and in Discord posts. On interpreting instinctive signals. A student asks, are instinctive pressures always easily decipherable? I'm wondering if simply not or if they always are, and it's complexes which distort the message. Steve replies, The biggest inhibition to instinct is mature, rational cognition. Complexes are most often variegated, superpositioned, informational states that may have a strongly represented cognitive component. As humans mature, cognition differentiates, as it did as an evolutionary adaptation. In young children up to puberty, pansepian instinct is natural, according to the stage of lifespan development. Meta-instincts are progressively rehearsed, through both solitary and social play. Puberty sees the genome release its final biological meta-instinctive program to contain and express the reproductive and psychosocial instincts. Thereafter, Cognition takes on a primary role in adaptation to the varied challenges of adult life. For modern humans in developed societies, affect and instinct intrude and threaten cognition, which in its arrogance regards the former as irrational. However, as I've said before, the solution to wrong thinking is not right thinking, it's right feeling. The rational ego and its prefrontal cortex grow away from their evolutionary foundation at their peril. Affect is the carrier wave of instinct, which is the emissary of its master, the genome. On complexes parasitizing libido. A student says, Every moment I'm being invited to either experience the present moment, life itself in its total reality, or else to withdraw back into my own complexes and cognitive associations and keep having the same experience of life over and over again, making the same mistakes and having the same results. Every time I choose the former option, I am allowing the unconscious and homeostasis as a whole to do its work. And these ideas and complexes that I thought were so central to my life grow ever more distant in both importance and intensity. Steve replies, There's a constant tension within the developing ego, between the primary need to adapt to the outer world and the pressure that comes from the unconscious to meet its requirements. On this, both Freud and Jung agreed, albeit from different perspectives. Of the two, Jung's position was by far the more sophisticated, but for each, what they found mirrored the irreducible ground of their respective starting point their endowed character and its limitations. We don't escape our personal equation easily. Indeed, it's the starting point for any true insight. We begin at a significant disadvantage. Our ego is immature and is beset from within as well as from without. 
other qualia of consciousness exist simultaneously and intrude their symbolic representations even whilst our cognitive ego distills through biological and psychosocial maturation. Our evolutionary psyche is real. This is not a reference to Ernest Haeckel's recapitulation theory, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, but rather to the work of Jung, Paul MacLean, Anthony Stevens, and others, as understood through a superpositioning and informational monism framework. The evolutionary psyche has an intrinsic consciousness of its own that impresses into our developing ego under instinctive pressure, that itself is on timed release from the genome. Homeostasis in a whole human system does not always deliver smoothly. Indeed, given the adaptive demands made upon it, it doesn't because it can't. The pressure we experience subjectively from the non-ego consciousness of the so-called unconscious has to be systematized into representational forms that echo past adaptations to the evolution of consciousness, as we understand consciousness as such to be. Higher potential minds, as they develop in parallel with their maturing brain, will often come under the influence of occult, magical, superstitious, or other such influences, because of that instinctive pressure from within. In some, if combined with substance abuse, or if filtered through a normal maturational or individuation neurosis, then fantasy becomes the holding space, for as long as it, the fantasy space, can be sustained. If there is no severe mental illness, then maturation will regulate the developing ego into an adaptive range, appropriate for lifespan development. Creativity is often the result of this pressure, but it must be remembered that unbounded creativity is a precursor to mental illness through Jungian style inflation. The key is ego strength. The ability to be forensic helps here, as it will seek out the real from the fantasy. Fantasy, based on the Paleolithic psyche, will find the supernatural and the occult where they don't exist, and miss the reality of the parapsychological where it truly operates. The modern human ego, if it is of high potential, will be required by genomic pressure to understand itself and its extended environment, in ways that occupy many different states of consciousness simultaneously. This is not easy. The wrong way to go about things, unfortunately, is easy. We need to avoid hyper-rational, cognitive reductionism, as that contraction of consciousness is maladaptive. We need, too, to avoid being drawn into inflation and pseudo-consciousness by forces we do not understand. The task is not, as I have said, easy. It takes time, and it takes hard lessons, which is Darwin's answer to the conundrum of mere being. The student replies, On reflection, this message also brings into focus one of the topics discussed in one of the recent Young to Live By videos. The more complex an organism, the more potential it has for higher consciousness. But there is also an equally increased potential for things going wrong, and for making mistakes. That's what makes it so difficult. However, when one goes through the task and finds the right homeostasis for them to live naturally, themselves and the world will be equally rewarded. Steve replies, Yes, and that is the troublesome stage human consciousness is at right now. The human brain is capable of generating as much nonsense as sense when it comes to virtual modelling. When this expanded capacity becomes overamped, either through a seeking system that's operating without a context, or within one that is too limiting, then the drive state is such that it has to be ducted into fantasy, or perhaps a conversion into symbolic, symptomatic representation, either in the body, the interpersonal domain, or both. Homeostasis in a whole human system is so complicated that its regulation may necessarily be suboptimal 
in some areas and over adapted in others. The genome can tolerate suboptimal adaptation for extended periods of time, but whatever potential we have will always generate instinctive pressure to actualize itself. We can predict that evolution will look for ways for consciousness to escape the functional limitations of biology, whilst using biology to create the means of onward progression. Evolution is biological, but in a systems and informational sense, it operated before biology and will continue to push beyond it. On the expression of complexes in the body. A student asks, I have a question about the effects of complexes on the body. This morning I tried to practice presence, resulting in a sudden tsunami of negative emotions mid-morning, accompanied by a strange sense of derealization. Now that I've recovered, I notice not only low energy, but also a strange feeling in my back, which wasn't there before. It's as if, initially, the complex was located at a cognitive level, as usual, and the state of presence has somehow weakened it. Then it appeared in an affect-toned state. When I disidentified with it, then it passed into the body. Is such a thing possible? Steve replies, It is certainly possible, but it's important to understand that what presents in one form and then another are aspects of the same informational field. What the psyche puts there, the psyche can take away. The student replies, Thank you, Steve. Can you please elaborate a little bit more about that last sentence? What the psyche puts there, the psyche can take away. Steve replies, Informational transduction, Ernest Rossi, converting or transducing information from one representational state to another. This is the dynamic that underpins so-called hysteria, as in hysterical conversion reaction, symbolic conversion, somatoform disorder, and any stress reaction that converts from psychology into biology. Complexes are systems of representation that can occupy all of these states. However, if the psyche transduces then it can reverse the process, or transform the repressed information into something healing. On complexes tricking the ego, and the mother complex. A student asks, can complexes be positive, such as containing instinct which can be used for relating to family or friends? Or are they always negative? I ask as I've heard some people mention a positive mother complex. Steve replies, Yes, positive complexes are real. They're simply systems of information that work well for homeostasis and lifespan development. However, it's important to hold in mind, firstly, that when complexes are discussed in a clinical sense, or even personal development, then it's usual to do so in regard of their negative configuration and effects. Secondly, although a positive-negative polarity seems complementary in modelling and understanding of complexes, it's actually a trap, unless we are very familiar with the reality of their development, role and behaviour. There's a tendency, brought about by exposure to collapsed Jungian ideas, to find the opposites everywhere. This suits negative complexes nicely as the binary opposition between contending opposites generates the impression of an on-off state, with the embedded suggestion that the on switch, or state, for a negative complex can activate or reactivate at any time. The same trap awaits CBT, with its hyper-rational reductionism. Sufferers from OCD and related conditions fall for this trap, which is only made worse by binary polarization in CBT or Jungian therapy. To step away from this, consider the positive or negative mother complex to be a representation of a personal experience, and not a thing in itself that could be reified into an inevitable issue. 
It's the systematised residue of experience, of something, or someone, that is the complex. The solution to a negative mother complex is not the positive mother complex, it's a healthy sense of self, and relating to others. The so-called, for convenience, negative mother complex is the representation, in a man, of his early experience of his personal identity, value and relating, both to others, but also to his emerging ego, and its background, the unconscious. A man will initially trust his relating in both domains, according to how his understanding of these has been confirmed by his mother, hence the mother complex. This is why the Jungian anima in a man emerges out from the primary relationship to the mother. It's the relating function and system. Jungian archetypes that supposedly underpin complexes and provide the structure for them to form around are actually instinctive meta-scenarios and roles, meta-instincts. Jung was quite clear that a positive mother complex comes with its own pathology. This fact is so often overlooked because people become entrapped by a pseudo-Jungian obsession with the opposites. Truly positive complexes are not a problem, hence they are of limited clinical interest. Pathologically positive complexes are just configurations of workaday negative complexes, wearing the autosuggestive persona of their opposite, whilst maintaining their internal negative consistency. So, positive complexes, real ones, are just habituated systems of healthy adaptation. The student replies, Thanks Steve, I experienced this myself. When my complexes dissolve, then I begin to relate well, but upon their return, I feel like there's a huge gap between who I think I am and who I really am. Perhaps I'm dealing with a deep structure complex. Steve replies, The on-off polarity switch that complexes rely on the ego passively accepting is the mechanism of an auto-suggestion which firstly believes that complexes have been dissolved, and then come back again. It's imperative to understand that it is this that defines the functional polarity trap. The intention by the complex, behind the ego adopting that belief, is that it stays stuck supporting the negation of the negation. This is why building ego strength is so important, as that means disidentifying with the very tacit or implicit beliefs that support the ecology of the complex. It's necessary to start in the right place, and to intercept the neurotic alibis the ego excretes from itself under the unconscious influence of its identified with pathogenic complexes. A second student replies, Regarding the on-off issue, I interpret this as it's allowing complexes to keep the centre stage in someone's life. The person is always wary that they will get triggered, and that worry keeps them from proper engagement with life. I remember you saying, Steve, how the ultimate goal is to make complexes irrelevant, in the present and in the future. Steve replies, We often spend more time keeping illusions alive than we do actually living. Remember that a significant downside of having an enlarged and hyper-connected cerebral cortex is that we can generate as much nonsense as sense. A trickster finds thoughts for underused minds to think. Underused, here, means unproductively used. The spare capacities we have can be used to be creative in a positive, generative way, or they can systematise by being configured into complexes. Because we are social, we tend to reify complexes and make them imaginary characters, autonomously running around inside our heads, in like fashion to how outer, real people have autonomy in our external world. Complexes adopt the path of least resistance to their survival. So if the ego generates fantasies that make them into reified inner characters, then the complexes in question will readily accept. 
Their Sheldrakian field knows that the Ego's psychological immunity will not attack something the Ego regards as being itself. So, be careful about internalising the negative anima, or the shadow, or other Jungian fantasy constructs. As soon as the Ego identifies with them, then a complex configures around that internalised identification, and associates to itself any learning based on the supposed characteristics and dynamics of the internalization. Meanwhile, the real complex, as such, is concealed and remains protected by the ego fictions, internal projections, and auto suggestions that busy an overexcited cerebral cortex. On complexes persisting after disidentification, Steve writes. Complexes are whole patterns of being and doing, and the degree to which they are habitual, in the usual sense of the word, is that which generates the inertia of familiarity with them. This means that they act as tacit adaptations that intrude unconsciously because they formed part of our self-concept, i.e. we identify with them. This persists for some time after we make a cognitive shift away from identification. This is because complexes are not only cognitive, and not only behavioural, they are superpositioned patterns of information that, at an affective and sensory level, we implicitly identify with. So we should expect some persistence of their field strength, whilst we adjust our adaptive homeostasis, to disinclude them in our lives. On trusting instinct. A student says, At the heart of my OCD was a deep mistrust of instinct. I had a similar view of instincts as Freud. That is, they are aggressive and sexual, and if I let go and trust them, they will lead me to my demise and I will hurt others. It turns out it's the other way around. Trusting and having faith in them is the most helpful thing I have ever done in my life. Steve replies, a very important insight. Instinct is the carrier wave of the genome's intentionality. It has to have survival as a baseline response, albeit modifiable under certain meta-instinctual conditions. Meta-instincts are the context for fundamental Pansepian instincts. By their libido shall ye know them. People at odds with instinct to the extent that they take on a pure Freudian aspect will seek out Adler to deliver them into the world. Freud seeks Adler. Adler conceals Freud. Fantasies of a pathological kind then lead to Jungian inflation. Jung inflates and falls victim to both, which recursively loops back into debased Adler and degraded Freud. Such is the drive state of internet gurus, who peddle fear and attachment to their misfired personalities. On complexes resisting the ego, and typology as representation. A student asks, Sometimes when we try and bring about homeostasis, can this lead to psychosomatic symptoms? For me, I seem to get GI symptoms whenever I resist my OCD which is subsequently followed by positive progress and weakening of the complex. So, could the intermittent psychosomatic symptoms be a metaphorical last stand for the complex? Steve replies, Yes, a qualified yes, as in yes it frequently does, but also given due regard to the context, which includes you and your insight and understanding, that you must understand the how and the why, and why the why is not a reason to fall back into OCD. This is not to suggest that you will, but OCD can utilise any understanding gained of itself by the ego to attempt to distort what it hears to support the complex. The how is a simple superpositioning effect that displaces the expression of the complex into another representational state which may be symbolic. So, the how is via any of the familiar transduction pathways, identified by Ernest Rossi, with the addition of the body's acid-base regulation, 
as a field of informational transduction and regulation in its own right. This is particularly true where smooth muscle spasm may be involved, that is in the body's smooth muscular tubing, arteries, the digestive tract, the lungs, etc. However, the first place to be affected by change in pH is the brain. This is very well documented, and the result of it can be the initiation or re-triggering of many conditioned states as they're identified by Rossi, and indeed by Jung, that is, complexes. The way in to psychologically address these states is via the different qualia of consciousness available to the ego. These qualia are resonant with Jung's functions, but are not collapsible into the usual understanding of them in pop psychology. Using dialectical syncretism, we can reverse engineer Jung's intuition and the process of introspection through which he investigated it, which led him to classify the functions of the ego's representation, that is, consciousness, of its own state, and of that which it is not, back to itself. So you get the thinking, feeling, sensing and intuition qualia of informational reflexivity. Cognition, or thinking, is usually the start and the end point of understanding in an adapted individual. Initially, it is insufficient beyond itself and only draws conclusions based on its operant principles. It is collapsed and rational. Affect, or feeling, is the bridge to the non-ego conscious, that we usually call the unconscious. It simultaneously occupies the rational and the instinctive domains, but serves best as the ground to the figure of cognition. The ground invites cognition to move, via instinct and its bridging affect, to go beyond itself into meaning. The meaning is represented through intuition, that is, it is grasped as an apperception of a field in resonant state with itself, and available for the homeostatic self-regulation of the whole field of an individual. Sensing here has two contexts. The first is, as Jung distinguished it, as being in two complementary attitudes, extroversion and introversion. In the extroverted form, it is exteroceptive, but in its introverted form, it is not interoceptive, but in the form of an imago. That is a sensory configured representation. The second form of sensing is that utilized by NLP, as the conscious constructive ego participant representation of information that is subject to change and integration into a new understanding. This natural process is also the basis of tantric meditative practice. In the context of OCD and the somatic representation of information previously regulated by an OCD complex, the change in resonant state of the field of the complex can be addressed by many means. The introspective exploration of the field by the ego can achieve this by following the appropriate qualia progression with cognition or thinking in its final form, being that through which the ego consolidates its understanding into a model of its experience. To start with cognition, as if that was all that was necessary, is a very common error. On complexes confirming themselves. A student asks, do complexes become active when you're around other people, in order to find confirmation from others for that complex? Steve replies, yes, they seek confirmation from the ego and any psychosocial context they can co-opt, such as motivating the ego to solicit confirmation from third parties directly and indirectly. This can include transference provocations, the pacing and leading of conversations towards confirmation of the complex, and the manipulation of the behaviour of others. These others can include therapists. Complexes are innately superpositioned, and they adapt readily to the opportunities this provides for them, under cover of remaining in an unconscious but autonomous state 
outside of the scrutiny of the ego's partitioned understanding of itself. On complexes and synchronicity. A student asks, if complexes are superpositioned at various levels of representation, does that mean they can be involved in synchronicity? Steve replies, insofar as synchronicities are conscious representations of constellated waveform patterns, then any system that has a qualia of consciousness can potentially experience such waveform patterns. For human ego consciousness, the intuition of the relationship between distributed informational states that are apperceived as being both connected and meaningful subjectively defines synchronicity, as understood by Jung. To be synchronistic, the perceived meaning must be subjective and be represented outside of the senses intuitively. Intuition as a qualia of consciousness exists and functions independently of any systematized model of typology. It's not about a Jungian preference style like MBTI, but a natural, intrinsic qualia of consciousness. So, complexes from within their configured informational field can both experience and generate synchronicities. This includes them being revealed to the ego by synchronistic field dynamics as part of whole system homeostasis. On complexes localized to certain parts of the body. A student asks, can specific complexes form in specific parts of the body once instantiated? I ask because I notice the dexterity in my left hand comes back after a Freudian release of instinct obviously being trapped by a complex. Steve replies, there's a lot to consider here. Any representation of information that has a dynamic character to it, such as an apparent correlation between somatic and psychological states, can be the symbolic representation of a complex. We need, of course, to understand what complexes are, how they form, and how we, through, for example, identification with them, may become appropriated to their dynamic field. This is an aspect of identification with the field of the complex, but can also be alignment with it, as being in resonant state with its representation, but without ego identification with it. This can further be compounded by a transient, non-identified or non-aligned field resonance with the complex's autonomous activity. Such non-aligned autonomous complexes have a waveform embedded within that of the non-ego conscious, otherwise called the psychodynamic unconscious, the cognitive unconscious and their neural memory and learning and field substrates. We must remember that complexes are superpositioned with the whole field of an individual. The association by the ego to such a background turnover of informational representation can change the field state of the complex into alignment or an identified with status. This can be temporary or more extended in terms of both time and of informational association to the complex, which can then associate to other representations, memories and learning. This is important as suggestion, including crucially auto or self-suggestion, is part of the process of dissociation, complex formation and maintenance. We are quite capable of generating a symbolic relationship to something that was not associated to, say, a complex, through this mechanism of suggestion, hetero or auto. Suggestion equals influence, which equals the exchange of energy, libido and information. With this caveat firmly held in mind, an apparent symbolic connection between observed, introspective states in ourselves, or as reported by others in a clinical context, can be indicative of complexes. How the ego then models and deals with this information 
will be part of the process of resolving the complexes in question. Everything is context specific. Ego strength is the first step. On complexes and stomach aches. A student asks, I've recently developed what I think is psoriasis. The internet just told me it was either a genetic or autoimmune issue, which was deeply unpleasant to deal with. My father had similar symptoms a long time ago, so I thought to re-watch the Young to Live By video, treating skin conditions through psychotherapy, in the name of the father. Immediately afterwards, I got a stomach ache. It seemed synchronous with the contents of the video, that is, psychological information being expressed somatically. Could a complex be behind both the fear that I felt and the stomach ache? Steve replies, Before concluding that the stomach ache was psychological and not just normal metabolism, you'd need to be certain that your awareness of the stomach ache wasn't being projected over by your ego, i.e. interpreted as being connected when it wasn't connected at all. If you can be certain, then it could be as you suggest. When stress is relieved in its focus, it can shift in representation, as a perseveration. This can be caused by the habitual attachment we have had to being in a stressed state. Not being that way can feel unfamiliar, so the information formerly held in one state may shift into another. Too much attention to the unfamiliar representation can make it a completely new form of representation. If you know that your system can do this, then you know that it can stop doing it. Homeostasis would prefer not to shift old and dealt with representations around, and sometimes alerts the ego to the habit by signalling itself as a transient symbol of our habit. On life is suffering as a complex. A student asks, I'm noticing that there seems to be some ideas that are all-encompassing, as in they can direct all of your libido towards it. The idea that life is suffering seems to be one. People who believe this idea tend to say that we must think about all the suffering that has happened, and is still happening in this world, in order to live a good life. This idea leaves no room for other thoughts and emotions. Would this all-encompassing aspect be a sign of a negative complex? If so, what are some of the more specific or technical biopsychosocial manifestations of this aspect in someone's life? Steve replies, If someone asked me this, personally I'd suggest that, rather than ask, they should answer their own question, as in doing so, they'd be working to resolve it, rather than seek a confirmation of the complex by a third party. To represent the complex as a question asked of others in a collective space would then be a statement in support of the complex's representational psychodynamics and the modelling of its superpositioning biopsychosocially. We have a video coming out soon that cautions against doing this kind of thing when using creative media. It's the same in a text format. The questioner would know, as they have described in their question, what this complex does, but for them to solicit its representation in a forum like this risks simply extending the complex's field of representation through a model that the ego already associates itself with. For discorders who are studying depth psychology, it can be a useful thought experiment to analyse questions that occur to them and then generate an answer. The task then would be to identify any subliminal complex activity of a personal kind that may have authored the question in order to seek its own confirmation by proxy, whilst it concealed itself as an apparently objective line of inquiry. On internal projection preventing consciousness. Steve posts, A key insight is to understand that the ego is truly unconscious outside of the bandwidth of its immediate Miller number. This includes not only the immediate external sensory environment, but also outside of any internal representation that enters awareness from within. A reasonable observer will very soon conclude, if they don't collapse into immediacy, that everything else is still there, externally and internally, 
that is outside of our awareness of its field interaction with us. The ego readily projects and does so unconsciously. This includes a tendency to see itself in outer relationships, but also internally, internal projection. The unconscious nature of projection means that even when the idea of it is grasped, there is a greater difficulty in appreciating that it has happened, or that unless ongoing attention is maintained, that it will happen with the same regularity again. What is even less well appreciated is that the non-ego field of consciousness, everything that it is not, but is still intrinsically conscious of in itself, the so-called unconscious as both psychology and beyond, is capable of autonomously projecting past the ego, into the ego, and around the ego, including forward in time and representing the past as present now. This latter is, of course, transference in classical terms. All of this is superpositioning and forms an informational field dynamic. It is dynamic because it is not fixed in any absolute sense, although parts of the information so configured may indeed perseverate or persist as a dynamic fixation, as in, for example, Janet's fixed ideas. Complexes, both Janaean and deep structure, can act with autonomy and telic intentionality to superposition through field representational psychodynamics. Janet and Jung were the first to offer a refined appreciation of this phenomenon. So we should expect, and indeed can readily confirm empirically, that they do just that. As the ego blithely acts as if it were the only agent acting upon itself, from within itself, other dynamics operate independently, often constrained by homeostasis, but just as often not. Complexes are quite capable of innovating the ego to the extent that it simply performs according to their direction. That's when we may observe the phenomenon of intelligent action by complexes in generating a confirmation field for their intentionality. Unwittingly, the ego has been manoeuvred into co-opting others to confirm the complex. Such is the adaptive Darwinian strategy of these partitioned fields of information, in particular when they form implicit or tacit incorporates with the true ego outside of the Miller number. That continuity of reflexive identity, learning and memory, that is the self-concept. On complexes in relation to archetypes, and the work of Dr. Anthony Stevens. Note, this dialectic dates from before the very sad news was announced that Dr. Anthony Stevens had passed away aged 90. A student asks, is it fair to say that complexes are the individual manifestation of archetypes in the Anthony Stevens sense? Steve replies, Complexes are the adaptation of instinctive and genomic pressure to extrinsic outer demands, which includes the reflexive feedback, ego and self-concept, throughline, understanding of itself adaptively. So you can call those meta-instinctive, pansepian instinctive and genomic and field informational superpositioning factors as being archetypes if you wish, but that would be a collapse that cannot withstand the theoretical developments since Jung's time, or the developments in genetic, brain and evolutionary science. Jung's archetype model fails at so many levels that no one outside of the theory-laden Jungian model itself, who has any serious frontline experience, takes it seriously. Anthony Stevens was actually a pioneer in securing a translational basis for understanding archetypes outside of the psychoreductionism of Jungian psychology. He uses a blend of older and transitional language and is an essential figure in the history of advancing depth psychology. He is rightfully respected and even revered not only for his contributions, but also for his exemplary character and authentically lived life. 
To look back at Jung's model is, by analogy, to look back at pre-Copernican and Galilean astronomy in an effort to understand the position of the Earth and its motion relative to that of the Sun, or to stop physics with Newton and ignore general and special relativity and quantum mechanics. Things have really moved on. A way around the problem is to properly understand dialectical syncretism. But that simple discipline is so very difficult to apply from within a mind that is retrogressive or confirming only of fantasies. The student replies, Thanks, Steve. I'm reading Anthony Stevens' Archetype Revisited, which is what brought this question to mind, based on how Stevens defines archetype. He uses words like innate release mechanism, patterns of behaviour, and phylogenetic psyche. Could you elaborate more on Stevens's contributions? Also, are you saying that there really is no need to use the word archetype anymore because of the ideas that get commonly associated with it? Steve replies, Anthony's use of sign stimulus and innate release mechanism come from the discipline of ethology. Anthony is the main source for bringing ethology into the Jungian world, but Dr. Anthony Storr also contributed to this back in 1973, albeit in nothing like the same depth or breadth as Dr. Anthony Stevens. Dr. Stevens has been a supporter of IPSA since February of 1990. This year, 2023, on his 90th birthday, he restated that support, saying, Thank you, dear Steve and Pauline. You, Eric, and your students are doing a great work which will contribute to the survival of humanity. And as I approach the final years of my life, it is a comfort to know that this vital work is in such capable hands. With love and my deepest thanks. We respect Dr. Stevens immensely and take very seriously our duty to continue his work on through the IPSA model. Our view on the use of the term archetype is that it is now outmoded in part due to the pop psychology and celebrity culture that has captured it. However, it has been problematic from the start, as it was never properly defined by Jung, and he contradicted himself, seamlessly, over precise definitions of what they were supposed to be. Jung's understanding of instinct was reductive and 19th century in origin. Contemporary Jungians have largely abandoned Jung's usage of the term, and of its definitions over such things as anima, animus, etc. There is a strong woke element within contemporary Jungian analysis, which first arose in the 1970s. Internet followers of celebrity psychologists seldom understand either Jung's original work or how the mainstream of it has moved on. Dr. Anthony Stevens is without question one of the founders of the new paradigm in depth psychology that includes biology, evolution, and a rapprochement between those disciplines with Jung. Freud is being updated through neuropsychoanalysis, Solms and Pangsep. There is an IPSA move to bring Jung into neuropsychoanalysis, published reports in the journal Neuropsychoanalysis, published by Rootledge. Professor Eric Goodwin is part of the new paradigm in following Anthony Stevens and is acknowledged by Dr. Stevens as being so, with Pauline and myself. There are others contributing to this field too. Regarding the phylogenetic psyche, this is originally from Jung, reinterpreted by Anthony Stevens, and further developed in the IPSA model.